Uh, good morning, uh, everybody who's online and uh, people here in the room. Um, thank you very much for uh, joining us. Uh, I would like to uh, welcome all participants to this uh, Veterinary Info Day for Small and Medium-Sized Enterprises. Uh, my name is Ivo Klaassen. I'm the Head of the Veterinary Medicines Division and the Deputy Executive Director of the European Medicines Agency. And it's an honor for me to open this event with less than three months to go before the Veterinary Medical Products Regulation comes into force on January 28, 2022. Today, uh, for this meeting, we've got around 150 SMEs attending, but also representatives of international and EU regulatory authorities, academia, and stakeholder organizations. And I'm very happy with that. I'm very proud that this uh, uh, event is attracting that uh, much attention. Uh, the EMA SME survey in 2020 uh, uh, revealed that, um, the ESME, that, which was conducted on the 15th anniversary of the SME regulation, emphasized the importance of promoting the SME and innovation agendas, enhancing education and training, and facilitating engagement with SMEs and their stakeholders. And those are key themes in action for today. I'm therefore very happy to reinstate the yearly Info Day events for SMEs after a break due to the COVID-19 pandemic and at a crucial point in the implementation of the Veterinary Medicinal Products Regulation. And today's event will provide you with an overview of EMA initiatives supporting SME and service providers operating in the veterinary medicine sector. It will focus on the latest updates of the implementation of the regulation, and it will highlight the impact that the regulation has on you. The event will also highlight platforms for early dialogue with EMA, the range of support that companies can access to optimize development and the experience of companies with marketing authorization applications. We are working hard to support industry preparedness through events like guidance, training sessions, and via our program, Functional Mailbox uh, Vet Change Program, EMA Europe.eu, uh, which will be shared with you. And we encourage all of you to contact EMA for any questions that you may have. Hearing your feedback is important and will support us in the successful implementation of the regulation. And finally, I would like to bring to your attention the upcoming EMA Info Day, which will be the second EMA Veterinary Info Day this year, which will take place on November 30, 2021. It's only a month away, and we encourage you to participate in this event, which is open to all industry stakeholders, irrespective of size, so not only for SMEs. And uh, with that, again, I would like to welcome you, and I would like to hand over to Konstantinos Ziogas, who will introduce today's program to you. Konstantinos, you've got the floor. Thank you very much, Ivo. And uh, so my name is uh, Konstantinos Ziogas, and I'm uh, responsible for the SME office uh, here at uh, the European Medicines Agency. And it's a real pleasure to, um, to, uh, to see such a high level of attendance for, from um, vet veterinary companies. Um, and uh, so you can see here um, that uh, we have structured the, uh, this um, uh, event today in, in six sessions. So in session one, we'll, uh, we'll hear um, the EMA support on, um, during development, uh, whereas in uh, session two, we'll, we'll hear a little bit more details about uh, the, the marketing authorization um, uh, phase. Uh, then leading on to session three and four in the afternoon, we'll look at uh, what's happening in the post-authorization uh, and also looking at the, um, uh, the, the features and functionalities uh, um, uh, of the veterinary med medicinal product uh, regulation and, and uh, the, um, the related databases. <laughs> Uh, we'll finish the, the event with, with a Q&A session um, at the end, and um, where you will have an opportunity to, um, to, to ask questions, but also after each uh, session, we'll have a dedicated um, slots for uh, Q&A. So please, if you have any questions or, or uh, comment, uh, please uh, Put them on the um, on on the chat, and we will uh, take them up during the uh, after the uh, the presentations. Um, 
So uh, first of all, uh, yes, last, uh, I, I would like to already uh, like to thank uh, everybody who has contributed to this uh, program. Uh, so uh, people from uh, the agency, from the SME office, uh, from the, uh, the uh, veterinary division, but also our experts from the, uh, from the EU uh, network. And now uh, we will uh, start immediately with session one. And so the first speaker uh, will be uh, Clément Provençal. So Clément Provençal is, is working as a scientific administrator um, in the SME office. And he has a, he's a, as a background, he's a pharmacist from uh, the um, uh, Ex-Marseille University in France and also has a master in uh, re international regulatory affairs. So he's worked uh, at EMA before and also uh, spent uh, uh, a bit of time working as um, in a regulatory consultancy uh, before joining again the, uh, the agency uh, uh, SME office. So uh, Clément, I'll give you the floor. Thank you very much. Thank you very much and good morning everyone. I'm really happy to be to be here to give you uh, this presentation on the overview of EMA initiative supporting SMEs. Next slide please. So this is a short uh, agenda for my presentation and let's start uh, straight away with the first part on the EMA SME office. Next slide please. Again. Yes, very good. So, in 2005, the SME regulation was uh, was adopted with the aim to promote the innovation and the development of new medicines uh, by SMEs. Uh, and subsequently, uh, in December 2005, the EMA SME office was launched. Uh, so we have celebrated our 15-year anniversary uh, last year. The aim of our office is really to uh, um, act as a dedicated contact point for SMEs and provide assistance with regulatory, administrative, and procedural support, facilitating communication with small businesses and engage with the bodies, SME partners, and industry stakeholders. Um, at the bottom of the slide, you can see the six main pillars of the SME support that we offer at the EMA, and I will detail uh, them uh, in the next few slides. And before moving on, just wanted to highlight at the top of the slide some important milestone uh, with documentation that may be of interest uh, for you uh, to, to look at after this event. Next slide, please. So we're going to start with the registration as an SME with the EMA. Next slide. And uh, the assignment of SME status. So how does it work? Basically, there is a commission recommendation from 2003 defining the SME criteria uh, in order for a company to be considered as an SME. This is as follows. So a less than 250 employees and either less than 50 million euros of annual turnover or less than 43 million euros of balance sheet total. Um, in the case a business uh, meet with those criteria, then you are eligible uh, uh, for, uh, to be considered as an SME and for an SME status that will allow you to benefit from the SME support at the EMA. Uh, just wanted to highlight uh, that uh, there are subcategories in this uh, uh, SME um, criteria with the micro, small and medium sized enterprises. Next slide, please. So if you think uh, your business is eligible, you can submit an application, an SME application, which is basically uh, a form to complete uh, with supportive documentation uh, related to the ownership, but also like financial figures. Uh, upon receive, our team review it, and if everything is in order, you are then qualified as an SME and receive an SME status valid for two years. Uh, it is important to bear in mind that uh, the status needs to be renewed in due time uh, in order to still benefit from the SME support. Next slide. In terms of numbers, you can see that over the last 15 years since uh, the SME office creation, uh, the numbers of uh, registered SME has increased a lot. Uh, and in 2020, we had more than 1,900 companies registered with us out of which, in terms of uh, veterinary companies, we had 66 companies active in the vet sector only, and 85 active on both human and veterinary side. Um, in terms of location of EU-based uh, SMEs uh, in the veterinary field, most of them are uh, mainly in Germany, France, Ireland, and the Netherlands, and shortly followed by Spain, Italy, and Sweden. Next slide, please. 
We're going to move on now to the second pillar, the SME office support with the regulatory assistance. Next slide. So this is one of the main tools that we offer to, to SMEs with uh, administrative, regulatory, and procedural support uh, from, to queries that are raised by SMEs uh, that we receive either directly uh, in our mailbox or through uh, the SME helpline that is available for SMEs. The way it works is that either we reply to it uh, directly via email or phone. Sometimes it can benefit from a more consolidated reply, in which case we are interacting with other uh, departments within the agency. And we're also offering um, the possibility to hold meetings, the SME briefing meeting that I will describe um, in afterwards. In terms of topics uh, addressed, there are many topics that we are covering, but I have included the most uh, uh, raised topic here uh, related to the SME definition and incentives, scientific advice related question, regulatory points, and packaging and labeling requirements. From vet companies over the last five years, 5% uh, of the direct assistance provided was toward veterinary companies. And uh, three of the 66 SME briefing meetings that we held uh, were for, uh, for, for, for vet companies. Next slide. The SME briefing meetings um, that I was mentioning is one of the main tools that we offer as well, uh, which is basically a platform for early dialogue with SMEs in order to discuss the regulatory strategy of a medicinal product development. We navigate the range of procedures and incentives available at the agency level uh, with a multidisciplinary EMA group. It's uh, available on both vet and human side, and it's totally free of charge for, for SMEs. Uh, the project discussed are mainly at early stage, and here again, the topics covered are, um, are, 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 are we have many topics that we covered uh, usually in those, uh, in those meetings. And uh, the feedback from companies shows a high level of satisfaction. Next slide, please. We're moving on now to another pillar, the fee incentives. Uh, next slide. And uh, I have included here like the link uh, to the full detail of the fee incentives. Uh, which is available on our website. And I just wanted to highlight two points. Uh, the SME incentives provided by the SME regulation are maintained, and uh, the new veterinary medicinal product regulation related information are to be set out in revisions of EMA explanatory notes on fees that will be published uh, in the upcoming weeks. Next slide, please. In terms of other SME incentives, uh, we first have uh, training, such as today's event workshop uh, that we organize two times a year usually. Uh, the previous edition that we had are all available on our website with the presentations and the video recording. Uh, we also publish an SME newsletter three to four times a year that includes uh, and highlights uh, the most important latest news to be uh, aware of, but also like guidance, uh, um, information from the network and the commission, and also uh, public consultation, which are really important, especially for you uh, small companies. Uh, it, this is a way to make your voice heard uh, in order to get um, more or less um, guidances that applies to, to, to your business. So that's something to, to, to remember. And we're also sharing those uh, events, uh, news and information throughout direct mailings uh, throughout the year. We have the SME user guide, one of uh, the most important tool uh, in the SME office available on our website, which is a guide that is a digest version of procedures and tools and schemes that are available at the EMA in order to support product development um, in both human and veterinary side. The SME register is available uh, to all EU registered SMEs if they want so. And it's really facilitating and promoting interaction for partnership, networking between SMEs. And it's a really like a real source of information for, for anybody. And we try to participate as much as possible to conferences and events. Next slide. The product information translation is another really important uh, uh, aspect of the SME support. So basically, it's assistance with translation for the product information documents that are submitted in an initial marketing authorization application in case of a positive opinion from the CVMP. 
It's an important uh, tool uh, and incentives for companies in terms of workload and money. And uh, in 2020, we had uh, 23 product translations uh, provided at no cost to applicants for both human and veterinary companies. Next slide. I'm now moving on to the second part of my presentation, the support to innovation. Next slide. And here you can see the different tools uh, that are available in order to support innovation and the different opportunities to interact with EMA throughout uh, the development of medicines uh, towards the marketing authorization. Uh, I will describe some of them. Some others will be addressed by my colleagues later on today. So next slide. And I will be starting with early support to innovation and the so-called ITF for Innovation Task Force. So it's another forum for early dialogue with applicants on innovative aspects of medicines development. It's usually uh, targeting at emerging therapies, novel technologies, and borderline products. And uh, the topics that are addressed are covering scientific, legal, and regulatory uh, points. Uh, usually with a multidisciplinary group, which works in cooperation with EMA's working parties. And over the last five years, out of the 21 uh, ITF briefing meetings that were held uh, for veterinary products, nine of them uh, were for SMEs, so 43%. Another aspect is the EU Innovation Network, which is here to emphasize the cooperation between innovation offices at, uh, and the EMA, and to make the regulatory support for medicines developers available uh, at national and EU level, uh, levels more visible and attractive to innovators. Next slide. The scientific advice tool, which will be uh, described further on by my colleague Freda after this presentation, is, another, is one of the main uh, tools available at the EMA, where any feedback can be provided on scientific questions in quality, uh, non-clinical, and clinical uh, domain. At any time point of the development, usually uh, we recommend an early uh, uh, advice with subsequent follow-up uh, throughout the development of medicines in order to maximize the chance of success at time of MAA. Uh, out of the 115 scientific advice uh, given over the last five years on the VET side, 50 of them were for SMEs. Next slide. Uh, this slide is related to the experience with centralized procedure over the last five years from uh, SME on the VET side. So we had 14 uh, positive opinions, um, out of which 43% were for minor use, minor species products, which will be addressed by uh, in another presentation today. 43 products had received a scientific advice uh, prior to filing. 43 products were new active substances, and half of the application were full dossier. Next slide. And I'm uh, uh, arriving at the end of my presentation with some uh, take home message. Um, so there is specific support for SMEs and you are more than uh, encouraged to, to take advantage of them by registering uh, for SME status and make best use of the specific fee incentives for small businesses. Uh, we have regulatory assistance uh, that includes SME briefing meetings, as I mentioned. Looking for guidance is another really important aspect. European public assessment reports are a useful source of information, which you should uh, relate to uh, when developing uh, and when working on your project. And consult, of course, available guidance and the SME user guide. The main message uh, to remember is to come early and to come often. Uh, by making best use of available support and different tools available, uh, the importance of early rig and scientific advice in order to minimize uh, the quality issue that may occur afterwards is important uh, to emphasize. An early pre-submission dialogue and discuss pre- and post-licensing evidence generation plans for approval and access uh, should be remembered as well. That's it. Next slide. Thank you very much, and I'll be happy to take any question at the end of the session. Thank you very much, Clément, for the, your presentation so on the SME um, incentives and services that we have. Now we can move on the, the second presentation, and we're going to, um, to zoom in a little bit more on one of the uh, key incentives 
that uh, EMA has for available for uh, small companies to um, seek uh, or to receive advice on the development program. So the presentation is going to be um, is going to be done by uh, Frida Haslung Wilkström, and um, uh, Frida is is um, is actually um, uh, representing here um, or, or presents. Uh, um, the um, the uh, the activity as a chair of the scientific advice working party um, so at EMA so Frida is a, a veterinarian by training with uh, the PhD in infection biology and immunology um, and uh, she uh, works at the MPA um, for quite a long time and uh, she's been an alternate member and, and member of the CVMP uh, since uh, 2013. Uh, Frida, I'll give you the floor. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you for for inviting me to speak uh, today, and I will um, talk about the, some of the early support to to the innovation that is available to the SMEs, and focusing on the uh, scientific advice. Uh, I am uh, the chair of the scientific advice working party, and also um, a Swedish CVMP member. Uh, so um, that. Uh, I will focus on on uh, speaking on the opportunities for for guidance on the early support for SMEs. So we can go to the next slide, please. Okay, there we go. So um, yes, yeah, so um, concerning the, the different opportunities for for the SMEs developing uh, innovative uh, medicines uh, and support from the EMA, um, there are. Three major areas, so to say, uh, of types of questions and uh, where SMEs can get help, in, including the innovation task force that uh, Clément mentioned uh, in the previous talk, this regulatory advice uh, uh, provided by the EMA, and there's also the, the scientific advice, uh, um, which I will speak more about, and also on how the scientific advice working party functions. Uh, and is organized. We can go to the next slide, please. So the Scientific Advice Working Party is a working party to the CVMP, um, and, it, and it has 15 members, including the chair and the vice chair. Of these members, 13 are also members or alternate members of the CVMP, so there is a strong connection between the, the CVMP and the working party. Um, members are uh, selected based on their expertise, and it is the, the aim to uh, cover most areas of expertise within the working party, um, even if this uh, is uh, a bit of a challenge since we are addressing a very, very wide area of um, topics. The working party meets uh, every month uh, except for August, and the meetings are held in the margins of the CVMP meetings. Uh, since we are uh, closely linked to the work of the CVMP. Um, the text in the box is from the mandate of, of the working party describing uh, what the aims of the work of the working party is, and that is to provide recommendations to the CVMP on matters uh, directly relating to or indirectly relating to scientific aspects of the uh, veterinary medicinal products. And it, yeah, as I mentioned, we, have, we cover very different areas, including the maximum residue limits and, and um, quality, efficacy and safety. And also have questions of a more general na nature, uh, such as mums. Uh, uh, applications and uh, for months applications we will move into uh, the limited markets area instead uh, in um, after in, in the next year when the new regulation comes to comes into force. Um, this is just a very schematic view of the process for the scientific advice request. Uh, starting with uh, the request being provided uh, provided by the applicant to the EMA, and a validation phase where the EMA uh, secret secretariat uh, aids in uh, forming the questions so that there will be a maximum uh, output, and and the applicant will will um, get the, the best possible answer to the questions. 
Um, the request then goes to the Scientific Drive Working Party, where a rapporteur is appointed among, among the members, and the rapporteurs draft um, uh, a, a report that is discussed within the uh, Working Party. Um, and this uh, procedure usually uh, runs on a 60-day timetable uh, that can sometimes be extended to 90 days, depending on the complexity and, and the extent of the questions that are to be addressed. After the Scientific Advice Working Party adopts the um, report, it, it goes to the CVMP for a formal adoption, and this also provides the CVMP members to uh, an opportunity to, to comment um, on, on the report. So there are very many questions relating to the development of, of products uh, that you can have at different stages of the development. And uh, it may not be clear where the, the, uh, a specific question relating to the development should be put based placed to get the, the right answers. Uh, and sometimes there is overlap uh, between a question set that uh, covers or goes into several areas. So we try to, by giving you a few examples, uh, provide some some guidance on which type of questions that should be addressed to, to which uh, part of the, of the um, uh, available uh, services at the EMA. This first example con concerns a cell therapy product intended for treatment of dogs. And there is a preliminary dose determination study and a pivotal field study, trial planned uh, where the protocols are provided with the questions. And the, the question that the applicant has is whether the planned studies would be appropriate to address efficacy. So this uh, would be a clear example of a scientific discussion on the study design and data requirements for an upcoming application for marketing authorization. And uh, by going through the uh, scientific advice uh, request with this type of question, that it would provide a possibility to discuss aspects that are not addressed in guidance and to make recommendations on, for instance, uh, how to design the study groups, uh, what endpoints to use and, and parameters to be tested, and also to discuss specific issues for this product type and indication. Uh, and three R's aspect when when deciding on uh, defining the study. So this would be a typical uh, question for the scientific advice. Uh, the second example is of a product uh, that is a new live vaccine against the zoonotic viral disease. And how should safety be addressed in this case? Is there a possibility to make a theoretical assessment of risk uh, of reassortment, or is proprietary data necessary? Um, this would also fall into um, the category of scientific advice, where, um, where uh, uh, we can have a, some scientific discussion on the specific risks for this vaccine and how these should be addressed in an application for, for marketing authorization. And it would also be uh, at the stage where uh, product development has, has come um, um, quite a bit um, on, on the way. Uh, the next example is uh, of an um, active substance of biological origin um, where the mechanism of action is by non-specific immunomodulation. And the question that the applicant has is what type of data, what, what type of dossier should be um, presented for safety and efficacy in the, an application for marketing authorization? So the data requirements, the types of studies, and the dosage structure that, that will differ uh, quite substantially depending on the classification of the product, uh, whether it is an immunological or a biological product. Um, so, so that is a very uh, fundamental and important uh, um, point for during the development. Uh, however, the classification requests are regulatory issues, uh, so these should be addressed by the EMA and CVMP and not by, by the Scientific Advice Working Party. Um, um, this example concerns um, a product of a biological origin and is similar to an authorized product in the EU. And the question that the applicant has in this case is whether a hybrid application would be appropriate. Um, 
And again, this is a fundamental, uh, fundamentally important uh, question uh, for the uh, development of the product. The legal basis uh, is is very uh, fundamental, but it is also a regulatory issue that should be addressed by the EMA. Mm-hmm. However, um, when it comes to the questions relating to how similarity should be demonstrated and what data requ- requirements that um, that are relevant for this product, those are scientific issues. So those should be addressed by the scientific advice uh, working party. So there is a bit of an overlap uh, in uh, the questions that could could be asked. In this case, we have a product with a protein as an active substance that is under development. And one point that the applicant considers uh, and and wants to discuss um, concerns the use of novel bioassays for instance, for antidrug antibodies, potency and stability to characterize the protein. So this would be a question uh, that uh, could be put uh, during the early phases of development of uh, of the product um, to, to aid the applicant in, in strategic decisions yeah, on how to, to move forward during development. And these types of issues would be best suited for the innovation task force. Um, and the Innovation Task Force provides a discussion forum with experts uh, within the area um, that is, um, to say, a bit, a bit more inform- informal uh, as a discussion forum uh, with the applicant. Um, what should be noted here, however, is that the expressions, uh, the, the opinions that are expressed are those of the experts and, and not those of the CVMP as a committee. But this is um, um, an opportunity to to discuss and in an open discussion and have some uh, indication and help along the way um, to form some decisions on on the uh, further development. And this is just to to give some uh, um, advice on on how to phrase the questions in the scientific advice request so that you get the most value out of the the, the, um, scientific advice and the answers that you you will receive. Um, um, And it could be uh, considered quite uh, quite basic, but um, it does help uh, the the working party to provide uh, clear and informative answers if the questions are clear and specific and also if the relevant background information is provided, either summarized uh, or um, as in annexes. Um, This is an example of a type of question that we do see um, not very seldom, where the the question is whether the the data that uh, is presented and and available to date will be acceptable to, to to support efficacy for for the intended indication, for instance. This type of uh, questions cannot be answered by the, the scientific advice working party or the CVMP, since we cannot assess and conclude on data within the scope of a scientific advice request, but this needs to be done in the context of the application for marketing authorization, where the full data set is presented so that you have that, that the full context of uh, the application. So um, uh, if the, the working party receives this type of question, the answer would be that we uh, cannot uh, form an opinion on the suitability and acceptability of data at this stage. And this is just to inform you that there is, that there is further information available on the, the EMA webpage. Um, under the veterinary regulatory and research and development part. And here you can find more um, uh, concrete uh, advice on how to do the the scientific advice application, um, also on the uh, IRIS, that is the technical platform for submission of requests um, and and more detailed information. So so there there is uh, quite a bit of uh, further uh, information on on the practical aspects of the scientific advice request available. Um, thank you. And the next slide, I think that that was the final one. So uh, thank you for, for your attention. And I will be happy to, to answer any questions later on that you may have. So thank you very much.
Thank you very much, uh, Frida, for, for, your, for this excellent presentation, which highlighted the, um, the type of advice that me uh, veterinary medicines uh, developers can use uh, at uh, EMA, but also giving so, uh, some very good insights into the type of questions that can be raised by, uh, by, by companies and those that are um, uh, outside the, the remit of uh, a pure scientific advice type of questions. Um, now we can move to the third uh, presentation in, um, in session one uh, by uh, Susanna Casado. Uh, she's the vice chair of the Novel Therapies and Technologies uh, Working Party uh, at EMA. And here we're going to, to focus a little bit more on uh, novel therapies and technologies. So it, it, it's in some way a subset of... of um, uh, uh, De uh, medicines development, so focusing on, I would say, innovative, so uh, quote, between quote-unquote. So, uh, Susanna, I give you the floor. Thank you very much. Hello, good morning. So, uh, for the today's uh, agenda, I will start with a brief uh, definition of the novel therapies, and then I will move to the uh, description of the novel therapies working party. I will give you a general overview or objectives, responsibilities, composition, how we work, what are the groups, and we will a brief uh, details about the horizon scanning and the co or cooperation with other uh, European and international bodies. Um, in my last slide, you will find uh, some links in order you need uh, further information about, about this group. So, uh, as I um, said, uh, in the Annex 2 uh, of the Regulation 6 uh, 2019, uh, in its section uh, 5.1, uh, there are uh, specific requirements for novel therapies that I think uh, they will be very useful uh, for you if you are developing this kind of product. And, um, uh, as I said, uh, it uh, opened the possibility to address uh, data gaps by implementation of post-authorization measures, studies on a case-by-case -case, uh, basis using risk management plans. Uh, it is highly recommended uh, to seek advice from the agency on classification, dossier structure, and the data set to support quality, safety, and efficacy of this uh, product. Uh, additionally, if you have doubts if your product is a, a novel therapy, you uh, could uh, uh, go to the CDMP uh, by two procedures uh, using uh, scientific advice and also the procedure of eligibility. And then um, the CDMP will give you the, the, the answer you, you need in order to, to know if your product is a novel therapy. So next slide, please. Uh, now I will uh, start speaking about the Nobel Therapies Working Party. Uh, next slide. Uh, as an overview, uh, I would like to remark that the uh, Nobel Therapies Working Party depends on the CDMP. In general, the CDMP establishes a number of working parties at the beginning of, of each three-year mandate. And the CDMP consults its working parties on scientific issues relating to their particular field of expertise. In these specific cases, uh, the Nobel Therapies and Technology Working Party give, give, provides advice to the CDMP on all matters relating to veterinary novel uh, therapies and technology. Um, there was a previous uh, group. Uh, uh, for uh, working on, on this kind of, of product. It was not a working party, but it was a group of expert, uh, experts called ADVENT. This group was established in uh, 2014 to give advice to the CDMP on guidelines about the requirements applicable to novel uh, veterinary medicines. This, uh, this uh, advice was given on the form of question and answer, and you can find all this document in the EMA website. Uh, website sorry. Uh, the question and answer uh, documents that were drafted um, 
were related to a cell-based product and also to a, a monoclonal antibodies. Next slide, please. The objectives uh, of the group uh, are to contribute uh, to the establishment of a future regulatory framework for the authorization of this uh, product and also to foster and support innovation to enable the timely availability of novel therapies and technologies in the European Union. These objectives are aligned uh, with the EMA Regulatory Science Strategy to 2025 and also with the European Medicines Agency's Network Strategy. In general, uh, these uh, strategies uh, are focused on foster the scientific excellence in regulation of veterinary medicines for uh, the benefit of the animal and public health and also to increase the availability of these uh, veterinary medicines, the innovation, tackle with antimicrobial resistance, and address the supply chain challenge. Next slide, please. Regarding to our responsibilities are uh, to prepare and update, and update European and international guidelines, to give recommendation and advice to the CDMP, uh, as I already said, on topics related to novel therapies uh, and technologies, to address queries from other IMA committee, committees, working parties, European Union member states, and other parties, and of course to contribute to workshop and uh, to the training of the evaluation of these uh, medicines. Next slide, please. The team uh, involved on this uh, working body are uh, nine members. All of them uh, are European experts nominated and appointed by the CDMP. And uh, the presence of additional uh, observers from other European and international bodies is allowed. As an example, and uh, for the development of uh, guidelines of bacteriophages, um, we will uh, have the presence of uh, people from FDA, FDA and EFSA in, in our next meeting. But what I will uh, further explain uh, this, this, uh, this work uh, uh, before. And uh, so this uh, group started running in May 2021, and you have the names of the members uh, below. Next slide, please. Uh, how we work? Well, we meet uh, at least uh, uh, four times uh, per year. We already met on May and uh, in September, and we are planning to meet again uh, in November of 2021. The operational tasks agreed by the group are delegated to the operational expert group, and the Nobel Therapies Working Party coordinates the work of these operational expert groups, provide input into ongoing work, and give feedback to the CDMP of, of, uh, about the activities. The operational expert group are established on an ad hoc uh, basis. Next slide, please. So the operational expert groups are in charge of the operational activity, such as the provision of advice on specific topics and products, or drafting a guidance document, documents. Um, these uh, groups are composed by relevant experts in a specific area, um, I said they are coordinated by at least one Nobel Therapies Working Party member, and they are supported by the EMA Secretariat. They are assembled to deliver a specific task and discontinued after completion. Next slide, please. Regarding to the working plan, we establish the next priority areas that you, you can see below. Um, uh, we are collaborating with, with uh, the Safety Working Party on the development of a guideline um, to establish uh, 
the needs of evaluation of the uh, maximum residues limits for biological substances. Two uh, experts of the group have been appointed to collaborate on this matter with the other working party. Um, in relation to the monoclonal antibodies, uh, the, the available uh, guidelines will be reviewed and if needed, it will be updated. In relation to the cell uh, therapies, an operational expert group uh, has been uh, established in order uh, to draft a guidance on efficacy of cell therapy. Uh, it uh, is planned to address the relationship between the potency and the mechanisms of action and clinical effects of these uh, products, these cell-based uh, products. Uh, for protein and peptides on biological origin, uh, the group will be will give advice and the request uh, from uh, ask it from other uh, working parties. And for bacteriophages, another operational expert group has been uh, has been assembled in order to uh, draft a guidelines on quality, safety, and efficacy of bacteriophages as veterinary medicine. It is also part of our work, um, of our work uh, plan, uh, the Horizon Scanning uh, Survey, that I will talk about it uh, later. Next slide, please. Uh, you can see below um, the calendar. Uh, for the release of the guidelines on efficacy of cell therapies. The same calendar is applicable to the guidelines on bacteriophages. Um, we would like here to remark that uh, the concept paper uh, uh, drafted in relation to these two guidelines is uh, almost gray, and it will be adopted in the CBMP uh, hopefully in December. So for the first quarter of 2022, this concept paper will be released for public consultation and we invite all of you to review these uh, this, uh, documents and give us uh, advice, uh, your feedback, because it will be very important uh, for drafting the guidelines during the next year. Also to remark uh, here that the guideline uh, for these two matters will be released for public consultation in the fourth quarter of 2022. Next slide, please. This is the calendar for bacteriophages. That is the same as the previous uh, one. Next slide. Um, uh, regarding to the horizon scanning, uh, we are preparing a survey on scientific advice and discussions uh, meetings on innovative uh, products carried out by national competent authorities. The objective of this exercise is to identify emerging needs for targeted regula regulatory support and guidelines. We plan to launch uh, the survey on the fourth quarter of 2021. Um, the report of the result of the survey of the survey is planned to be available on the second quarter of 2022. Uh, finally, we I, I would like to uh, highlight uh, all cooperation with other uh, European and international bodies because we think it's, it's very important in order to ensure cross-domain alignment and international harmonization. And, and as I already uh, said, uh, during the development of, at least during the development of the guidelines for bacteriophages, uh, we will, um, we will, uh, uh, people from FDA, uh, EDQM and EFSA will attend uh, the, the meetings in order to, well, to, to obtain uh, harmonized uh, regulation and, and requirement. Next slide, please. Finally, uh, uh, in, in, you can see uh, below uh, some links, you know, in, in case you need uh, further information about our group or the mandate uh, working plan and uh, the question and answer document 
uh, drafted by by Advent. Next slide, please. So if you have any questions, uh, you can contact us by the email address you see uh, below. And this is all from, from my side. Thank you. Thank you and bye bye. Thank you very much, Susanna, for your presentation, which highlighted the work of the Novel Therapies and Technologies Working Party and uh, particularly the, uh, the work that is planned in relation to uh, guidelines development for uh, this product. Okay, so welcome in session two. My name is Johan Schefferly. I'm a co-opted member uh, of the CVMP and also vice chair of CVMP. And I'm uh, happy to to um, be given the opportunity to join this um, to join this day. We're diving directly into um, uh, into the second session. We will have three speakers, and um, as before, you can um, put your questions in the chat, and we will deal with them uh, in the Q and A session afterwards. After the three speakers. Okay, um, so I will announce the first speaker that will be Dr. Sebastian Giraud uh, from the European Medicines Agency, uh, the Department of Veterinary Pharmaceuticals Evaluation and Innovation Support. Um, uh, Sebastian is a doctor in veterinary medicine since 1994, and he has certificates in toxicology and in biological and medical sciences. Um, Sebastian Giraud joined the EMA in 2014 as scientific administrator. Um, he deals with maximum residue um, limits applications and supports the CVMP Safety Working Party. Mm -hmm. uh, previously, he has worked in the pharmaceutical industry for 20, uh, for, sorry, for 17 years as a toxicologist and manager in the research and development of new active substances for human use. So, um, Sebastian, the floor is yours. Yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, Joanne, for this uh, introduction and uh, good morning to uh, everyone. Uh, my uh, presentation is on the need for MRL evaluation for biological substances. Um, this is a, a new uh, approach to uh, assess the MRL status of some biological substances. A couple of uh, substances have uh, already been uh, assessed under this new frame. And uh, because this is a, a recent approach, I think it makes sense to, uh, uh, to present it today. So, uh, so this slide gives a, a little of, of context. Uh, the for uh, veterinary medicines for food producing animals, the pharmacologically active substance uh, need to be uh, allowed regarding MRLs, uh, except the active substance of uh, immunologicals. Uh, the standard MRL procedure uh, has been used uh, for both chemical and biologicals, non-immunological. Um, and uh, indeed, uh, the table one, which is the table of uh, allowed substances uh, of the Annex to Regulation 37-2010, includes uh, uh, both uh, chemical and biological substance. Uh, we have, for example, uh, some uh, uh, enzymes, we have some uh, proteic hormones in this, um, in this table. And uh, all these uh, substances were uh, addressed according to the standard MRL procedure. However, uh, it appeared that uh, uh, there was a need for a lighter procedure uh, to be used for some biological substances, uh, a, a procedure that will be uh, perhaps more adapted uh, to these uh, uh, cases. The so next slide, please. Um, so this is a, an overview of the different ways to address the MRL status. Let's consider an active substance. If it is a chemical active substance, it will be addressed by the standard MRL procedure. If it is an immunological active substance, it's, it's exempt from the MRL regulation, so in this case, no, no, no need uh, to uh, uh, go further regarding the, the, the MRLs. And uh, the, the case of the biologicals other than immunologicals is uh, addressed uh, here in the, within the red frame. 
um, there is a differentiation between the comical-like and the comical-unlike. If the substance is a comical-like, it will be handled like a comical substance, so the standard MRL procedure. And uh, if it is a comical-unlike, it will be evaluated on a case-by-case -case basis uh, to see uh, if an MRL evaluation is required. If it is required, again, the standard MRL procedure, and uh, if it is not required, the substance will be included in a list of biological substances not requiring an MRL evaluation. And uh, in this case, the, 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 the MRL status will be considered as uh, addressed too. Um, I have mentioned on the slide the, the, the case of the excipient, but there is no uh, change uh, regarding the, 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 the excipient, just for uh, information. Uh, the excipients can be handled either by the MRL procedure or by an out-of-scope uh, request. And the, the, the last option uh, is to be evaluated as part of uh, a marketing authorization procedure. Uh, but uh, in, in this case, uh, in this la la latest case, uh, the uh, conclusion will be uh, uh, given in the context of a, of a specific uh, product. It, it, it has been used, for example, for some uh, flavors um, uh, that were composed of a mixture of, of substances. The next slide, please. So the legal basis uh, is given uh, by the uh, regulation uh, 2018-782. And uh, uh, this is the, the, the regulation on methodological principles for risk assessment and risk management uh, for MRLs. Uh, the case of this uh, biological substances is addressed in the Uh, section 1.6 and 1.7 of the and 1.7 of this uh, of the annex to this uh, to this regulation. Uh, the next slide, please. So the 1.6 uh, paragraph says that uh, the biological substances other than the immunologicals are subject to normal MRL where it is chemical like and evaluated on case by case basis when it is chemical unlike. And uh, the regulation gives us some. Uh, elements uh, to uh, make the difference between uh, chemical-like and chemical-unlike. Chemical-like are produced by chemical synthesis. They have similar concerns to chemicals. And uh, they uh, leave residues in the same way. R uh, while the chemical-unlike, they are more complex. Uh, they uh, uh, may contain multiple chemical types. The residues may uh, be cells, amino acids, lipids, carbohydrates, nucleic acids, or uh, breakdown uh, products. The next slide, please. Uh, the 1.7 uh, says that uh, a report is, uh, is needed, and uh, uh, the, the report needs to uh, cover uh, a series of, of, of points. Uh, the uh, nature of the biological substance and uh, a comparison with similar substance to which the consumer uh, could be exposed to, uh, especially uh, naturally uh, occurring uh, substances. Uh, a description of the mechanism of action, the fate of the substance in the treated animal, and the possibility uh, of uh, residues in the food commodities. Um, the, the activity that the substance may have in the uh, human uh, gut, this is because uh, even if the substance is not uh, systemically uh, bioavailable for the consumer, uh, it may be that it has a, 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 a local activity in the digestive uh, tract. And uh, the, 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 the final point is the systemic availability uh, of the residues uh, with a worst case uh, consumer. Uh, exposure. The next uh, slide, please. And uh, the end of this uh, section says that uh, uh, biological substance for which it is concluded that an MRL evaluation is not required are published by the agency in a list of such substances. The next slide, please. So here is the list, or the, the, the header of the list. Um, this uh, list of biological substances uh, was uh, created in 2019 and, 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 and after that was revised uh, and updated. Uh, this uh, list is uh, available on the website of the EMA 
the next uh, slide, please. Oh, the list um, uh, currently uh, includes uh, four entries. Uh, two of them were, in fact, uh, transferred from the out-of-scope list to this uh, uh, list of biological substances not requiring an MRL evaluation. Uh, these are the probiotics and the stem cells. Uh, at the time, uh, they were uh, assessed. Uh, CVMP decided that there is no need for MRL evaluation, but uh, the, this uh, uh, specific uh, uh, process uh, was not available. It was before the, the regulation of 2018, and so this list, this biological list, did not exist. And uh, these two uh, substances or entities were, were included in the out of scope list uh, in absence of. Uh, uh, better alternative. But uh, now that uh, a list of biological substances uh, is available, it was logical uh, to transfer these two uh, entries into uh, the new list. Um, and uh, the two other uh, entries are uh, substances which have been uh, assessed under the new frame. Um, so uh, as you can uh, see, uh, there may be uh, some uh, restrictions in the entries. Uh, for example, restriction on the, on the route or uh, restriction on the dose. The next uh, slide, please. Uh, there is uh, an administrative process in place. Uh, the applicant has to notify the EMA that they intend to apply. Uh, the application is uh, mainly composed of uh, report and supporting documents, and this has to uh, cover the, 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 the different uh, points that we have seen before. Uh, there is a fee established. Uh, the evaluation is made by the CVMP. Uh, the evaluation is in a 60 or 90 day timetable. Uh, 60 days if there is no list of questions, 90 days uh, if there is a list of questions. And uh, where the CVMP uh, concludes that no MRL evaluation is necessary, uh, uh, the substance is included in the list, the updated list is published, and uh, we also publish uh, the summary of assessment uh, of this substance uh, for transparency reason. And uh, before publishing, uh, we uh, let the opportunity for the applicant uh, to comment on a possible uh, commercially confidential information. The next slide, please. Uh, the next uh, step is uh, the uh, scientific uh, guideline. The title of the guideline is indicated here on the slide. Uh, the, the, the objective of the guideline will be uh, to provide a structured approach on how to determine the need for an MRL evaluation for these uh, biological substances. And um, the guideline will also uh, clarify some terms. For example, it will give some clarification on the, how to differentiate the, the, the chemical-like and the chemical-unlike. It may also uh, bring a little clarification on the, 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 the notion of uh, biological, non-immunological non substances uh, in, in, in relation to the MRLs. Um, the, the, the concept paper uh, for the development of this uh, guideline uh, was uh, in public consultation very uh, recently. And uh, the guideline itself uh, is uh, currently uh, under development. Uh, the uh, safety working party is working on it uh, in uh, uh, collaboration with the novel therapy uh, working party, as was uh, mentioned uh, by a previous uh, speaker. Uh, the next slide, please. Um, you uh, have, uh, uh, you can find the, the relevant information on the website of the EMA. Uh, if you go to the web page on the MRLs, you uh, select the biological substances not requiring an MRL evaluation. The next slide, please. Uh, you uh, have. Uh, a few lines of background. Uh, you have uh, some explanation of uh, what the, the, the applicant uh, should do. Uh, number of uh, links are uh, included. The next page, please. And uh, you have, for example, a link 
to this list of biological substances, and you have also the link to the summaries of assessment uh, of the substances that have uh, already been uh, uh, assessed. Uh, the next slide, please. Uh, so, in, in conclusion, uh, it's a new procedure. Uh, it is lighter uh, than a full MRL evaluation. Uh, it's lighter in terms of, of dossier submitted. It's lighter in terms of timetable. Uh, we have seen a 60 or 90 day timetable uh, against uh, 210 days for, a, for an MRL procedure. Uh, it's a, a, a better uh, fit uh, than the standard MRL procedure to some biological substances. Uh, we have an administrative process in place. Uh, the first assessments, uh, exactly two, two assessments, have been uh, completed so far. Uh, you uh, have uh, the, the relevant information available on the EMA website. Uh, and uh, what is uh, ongoing now is uh, the uh, development of the, of the scientific uh, guideline. I think uh, that's uh, my uh, last uh, slide. Uh, I thank you uh, very much for your attention. I will be happy uh, to take any uh, questions uh, later on. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Sebastien, um, uh, for this uh, excellent overview. Um, we're really very happy that we have two speakers from SME companies. Um, and we have them um, in the order um, of uh, Suzanne Kennedy from Trivium Vet and uh, Amudena Padera from AT Court. Um, so we will start with the um, uh, with the um, um, Susan Kennedy, uh, who will speak about um, the SME's experiences um, with the um, with the EMA. Um, Susan has over. 12 years experience in uh, academic and translational research environments. Uh, she has a PhD in cardiac research from the University College of Dublin, UCD, and seven years of postdoctoral experience in um, colorectal and esophageal cancer research from the UCD and Trinity College Dublin. Uh, Suzanne has an extensive publication history from an, her international research collaborations. And in 2020, Suzanne joined the Trivium Vet and has been involved in the preparation of key scientific and regulatory documents for submission to the EMA and the FDA. So, Suzanne, the floor is yours. And many thanks to the organizers for the invitation to speak here today. So, um, I'm representing Trivium Vet and I'm going to be talking about our experience as an SME for scientific advice with the EMA. Um, next slide, please. So Trivium Vet is located in Waterford and we're down in the southeast of Ireland. So while most of you would be aware that rain and is synonymous with Ireland and it certainly feels that way in the last two days where it feels like we need a boat to get to work, Waterford is actually located in what is known as the sunny southeast. Next slide, please. And its location was actually voted as the best place to live in Ireland in 2021. Now, you may not see it from the map, but where I'm from is just above water to the neighbouring county called Kilkenny, and we'd be very much rivals. So I'm biased to say I think Kilkenny is the best place to live. Next slide, please. And next slide. OK, so we have a few animations here. So Trivium Bed was established in 2016. As I said, we're a startup company and we have 12 employees and it was established to bridge the treatment gap in veterinary healthcare for companion animals. And how we do it is by delivering innovative healthcare solutions. And our vision at Trivium Vet is to have a valuable impact on global pet healthcare. We have a number of different products within our portfolio, and they're at various stages of the product pipeline. Next slide, please. Um, so in particular, we have a focus on canine gastric ulcer disease, canine cardiomyopathies, and canine neuropathic pain. And we also are interested in feline cardiomyopathies and feline chronic kidney disease. So as I said, some of these products are at various stages of the product development plan, and we would have sought scientific advice for these products throughout their life cycle. Next slide, please. So why request scientific advice? So under the current regulations, so Directive 2001-82-EC and the new incoming veterinary regulations, Scientific advice can be requested for any veterinary medicinal product, 
Next slide, please. And again, we've a couple of animations here. Um, so the veterinary division of the Scientific Advice Working Party advises applicants in respect to quality, safety and efficacy questions of med medicinal products. So these could be in relation to questions regarding MRLs, questions in uh, relation to do dose justification um, in terms of bioequivalent studies for generics. So a number of different areas in which they can uh, provide scientific advice. The advice is valid throughout the EU, and that's irrespective of the authorization route you choose. So regardless of whether you're looking at the centralized or the decentralized procedure. And next slide, please. And the advice given by the agency is not binding. However, it is taking it taken into consideration upon evaluation of your marketing authorization application. Next slide, please. So as alluded to this morning by Frida and Clement, the Scientific Advice Working Party, they meet once per month. So timing of your request as an SME is really important. Um, the, when you are applying for your Scientific Advice request, you must submit a letter of intent. And this letter of intent is submitted 30 days prior to the actual meeting date itself. Then 22 days before the meeting takes place, you must submit your Scientific Advice, your questions and your background information. Next slide, please. And it was discussed again this morning in terms of the, um, the structure of these is very important. So the letter of intent, the template is available on the EMA website, as is the scientific advice template also. And these requests can for scientific advice uh, can be during the initial product development stage or during post authorization. Next slide, please. So as Frida alluded to, the questions that you um, posed must be clear and precise. So this is very important as you want to make sure that when you uh, submit your scientific advice, you are going to receive clear answers to what, what, you, uh, what questions you had. And as I said, these could be in relation to dose justification, endpoints in clinical trials, um, for example. If you feel that your questions that you have, that perhaps you're not ready to submit to scientific advice directly, there are preparatory sessions available in which you can discuss uh, the frame of your question and how best to ask it. And they would normally take place one month prior to the scientific advice meeting. Next slide, please. So once you have your background, your letter of intent submitted and your background information and your questions submitted, the scientific uh, advice working party meet. They are then given either a 60 or a 90 day review period from which you to respond. So 60 days is the standard review period or 90 days if you have uh, provided complex questions. Um, in, and also 90 days can be if you are seeking parallel advice. So um, if you're seeking parallel advice with the EMA and the FDA, for example. Next slide, please. And again, we have a couple of animations here. So if you want to click, please. Thank you. Um, so from our point of view, we submitted scientific advice um, for, as I said, a number of different products. So in this instance, we had submitted scientific advice for a mum's limited market product. Next slide, please. And in particular, we had dose justification queries and we had queries in relation to uh, the design of a clinical study. And next slide, please. I think there's maybe five more clicks here. So in terms of the timing, we submitted our letter of intent in May. Uh, in June, we had prepared our background package and our questions. And this was sent uh, in order to be ready for the July scientific advice um, working party meeting, following which we received our correspondence in from CVMP of who the rapporteur was, and we received a timetable of how long the uh, review period would take. In this instance, we had a 90 day review period and in October we received scientific advice. Next slide, please. And again, please, thank you. Uh, similarly, we had another product in which we were looking for uh, specific aspects in relation to the safety part of the dossier, so a part three submission. Um, in this case, we had questions in relation to whether developmental toxicity or carcinogenicity studies were required. We submitted our letter of intent in July. In August, we prepared our briefing package and submitted that. September, the uh, CVMP uh, meeting was held and we were we were, um, received correspondence in relation to the timetable and the rapporteur. And in this case, it was a 60 day review period. And in November, we received our scientific advice. Next slide, please. 
And this was really important as an SME. Sorry, just go back one. Thank you. So as an SME, this was really important for us. Uh, and back one again. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, this is really important uh, to us to receive the scientific advice in relation to the part three studies and it allowed us to uh, forecast in terms of what studies we needed to do, how long it would take to complete studies and also forecast in terms of budgeting that was required to complete studies. Next slide, please. And as we're on the topic of budgets, so scientific advice does come with some fees and these fees can range depending on what scientific advice you're requesting. So if it is a case that you have a single uh, query in terms of either clinical or efficacy studies or quality, uh, fees can be 11,400. But if it's a multidimensional query, it can be up to 44,400. But before you go and break the piggy bank, it is important to note that there are incentives available. Under the current directive, veterinary directive, uh, if you have a mum's limited market product, you do not actually need to pay for scientific advice. So scientific ad advice is free. However, in the new incoming veterinary regulations in January, you will have to pay, but there's an incentive of 50% uh, to what the scientific advice fees are. And next few clicks, please. The explanatory note on the fees payable to the EMA, which Clement referred to earlier, is very valuable. And as he said, that document will be updated in a couple of weeks. Um, and what's even more important is that as, a, as an SME, so if you have less than 250 employees, a turnover of less than 50 million or an annual balance sheet of less than 43 million, uh, the scientific advice, there is an incentive of 90% as an SME. So this is really critical and it's uh, great to hear that it will be implemented, remain implemented under the new veterinary regulations. Next slide, please. And we have a few clicks here as well, please. Thank you. So. Um, from our point of view as an SME, scientific advice has been very beneficial to us in terms of developing what clinical studies we need to conduct and in terms of uh, the dossier compilation itself, also in terms of, of timings. So as I said, timings are very important, not only for requesting scientific advice and the review periods that it takes, but also determining what studies are required for your dossier. The fee reduction is absolutely critical for an SME, so it's great to see that that 90%, as I said, is uh, still applicable in, in 2022 under the new regulations. There is valuable guidance and templates available online, which I recommend that you look up. And I'd also recommend that you reach out to the uh, EMA SME office as well for uh, advice. And next slide, please. So with that, I would like to thank you very much for your attention today and best of luck if you are seeking scientific advice and many thanks to my colleagues in Trivium Vet. Thank you, Johan. Thank you, Suzanne, for a very clear um, uh, presentation. And, and then we will straight move uh, to, the, to the next speaker, um, Amudena Pradera, who is hopefully also in a very beautiful place. Um, Amudena is a doctor in veterinary medicine um, and she's uh, in Equicord. She ha holds a PhD in physiology and pharmacology and is the chief scientific, of scientific officer and the head of regulatory affairs at Equicord. Um, Amodea, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. I have been invited here to talk about the success experience of Horsten. Uh, the submission of uh, this medicine has been hard, so it is a real honor uh, for me to be here today. Next slide, please. Horstem is a veterinary advanced therapy medicine based on allogenic equine umbilical cord mesenchymal stem cell indicated for the treatment of equine osteoarthritis. Horstem was the first stem cell a uh, based medicine submitted for centralized marketing authorization for the European uh, agency, but also worldwide, and was developed by a uh, three employees company at the time of submission. So we were a micro company. And you can imagine that with this background, being the first medicine of this nature submitted and with a company with very, very little experience, the um, regulatory process was long and uh, complicated, so uh, we are very proud to be here today with the success case of Hodgson. Next, please. Before submitting a new product, many phases must be complete. 
uh, yeah, such as uh, preclinical research, good manufacturing practice, manufacturing and scale up, uh, clinical phases, uh, target animal safety, safe, uh, regulatory uh, clinical pivotal uh, and exploratory clinical trials, and also the dossier preparation. And uh, small and small and medium companies are aware of these activities, and they reserve time, money, and human resources to, to all these activities. But little is talk about the uh, potential needs in a second phase of the uh, post-submission activities. Many companies, and the same happened to us, think that the submission of the dossier is almost the last step of the, of the way, but is not that case at all. Next step, please. The regulatory phases in high innovative medicines could be uh, long and complicated, and the submission of the dossier is just the first step of the process. There are uh, some milestones in a regulatory process that are very well known by all the applicants. Uh, 20, uh, 120 and 180 clock stops are steps that all the applicants know that must comply, but also could have uh, extraordinary uh, steps during the regulatory process. And many times, small and medium companies do not think about these potentially difficult steps during the regulatory phase. We could have extraordinary clock stops. We could have a preliminary negative opinion and then a step of expert committees. And we need to be prepared to these potentially extraordinary steps during the regulatory phase. Next, please. So uh, the problem of this unexpected, long and complicated uh, regulatory phase is that small and medium companies very usually have very limited reserves. And if time is money for any pharmaceutical company, with easing it, it's not also uh, important, could be vital because unexpected delays in a regulatory phase could put in risk the whole company and the survival of, of the project. So uh, if you work in a small and medium company and you are developing innovative medicine that is quite useful in this kind of small companies, it's very, very important that you take into account that the regulatory process could be longer, difficult, and uh, with a step that you initially don't think that could occur. And you might, must be prepared and uh, have human, financial, and time research to cover these unexpected steps. Next, please. So in innovative uh, product, um, the regulatory uh, could be uh, the regulatory phase uh, could be more complicated, and the risk of complicated phases in innovative medicine are much higher than in conventional treatments. So uh, we need uh, to be prepared, and uh, we need to uh, reserve financial uh, and and time uh, for submitting these kind of questions and, and steps. Next, please. So it seems that everything is against us. We are small companies. We usually work in high innovative technologies. We have very limited research. We have pressure from our investors. We are a small companies with a, with very little number of employees. We are very, very inexperienced. So everything seems to be difficult for uh, small and medium companies. And the truth is, it's difficult. But we have something that makes us great, is that we cannot afford to fail. Fail is not an option for small and medium companies, because many, many times our survival depends on our success. So it doesn't matter how difficult, long, and exhausting is the regulatory process. The only solution is to work, 
solve all the questions that has been raised, repeat what has been requested to repeat, and just keep a positive opinion. Next, please. And I don't want that my message sounds pessimistic. Holstein was a success. And we are very, very proud that what a micro company has done. In the Horston case, we have like a perfect storm. It was the first medicine of this nature, the first stem cell based medicine submitted. We have no guidelines available, and we were a very inexperienced small company. So our regulatory process was very, very long, complicated, and <laughs> quite hard. We have a, a clock stop in the 10820 of more than one year, where we need to repeat many, many parts of, of the dossier. Then we have an extraordinary clock stop in the day 188 uh, that took six months uh, to solve. And uh, we uh, finally get a initial negative opinion with an expert committee who finally, after three years of regulatory process, uh, endorsed the safety, quality, and efficacy of Horstem. So finally, we got a very strong positive opinion of the CBMP and the uh, European Commission. So uh, Horstem is the case where fail was never an option. And finally, we get our positive opinion. Next, please. So thank you very much. Good luck. And my advice is to work hard until you get your positive. So thank, thank you very much, uh, Abedena. And um, uh, thanks to all speakers um, in, in this session. Um, now we will move on to session three, um, which uh, is about the um, veterinary medicinal products uh, regulation, so the VMP reg, so as abbreviated on, as you can see in the uh, in the program. And we will start first with uh, a presentation from uh, Jordi Torren um, on. Uh, which will who will provide an update on the uh, implementation of the uh, VMP regulation. So Jordi, uh, I think I won't go into a very long introdu introduction, but uh, he's been at the agency for uh, um, uh, a long time. So he's a long-serving uh, member of the uh, 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 at the EMA Vet Division, and is currently head of the Evaluation and Innovation Support Department at uh, the European Medicines Agency. So. Uh, Jordi, I will give you directly the floor uh, for uh, this 20 minute, uh, minutes uh, presentation. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Konstantinos, and thank you for inviting me to this presentation. Yes, I've been here for a long time, so I think that the picture you just saw on the screen is from the first day that I arrived at the office, <laughs> at the agency. So I'm going to try to present to you about the regulation EU 2019 6. Um, I think it's a very timely uh, presentation in the sense that today is the 28th of October, so three months before the implementation date in 28th uh, January 2022. So basically this uh, regulation that as most of you will know will be directing how we work on veterinary medicinal products for the next years. Basically, the legislation provides a modern and innovative uh, legal framework, gives incentives to stimulate innovation. That's a very important part of, 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 the, of the legislation, gives incentives to increase the availability of veterinary medicines. And for that, we think especially the small and medium enterprises could play a key role into this increase of availability of veterinary medicines. Um, and importantly, also, it has uh, many actions on relation to the use of antibiotics of in animals and antimicrobial resistance. So if you see the timeline, um, the, the regulation was approved on 11 December 2018. And if you look at the end, we are getting very close to 2022. 
Um, if we I can have the next action, please. So we are there now. So that's quite frightening close to the implementation date. We've been working very hard for three years. In fact, some of us for during the previous years, it took a long time really to prepare this, this legislation to be in place. So now we are starting to see the outcome of all those activities. And I hope to give you a brief summary of where we are in the different areas on the implementation of the legislation. Uh, let's not forget that the legislation arrives in the middle of a pandemic and it really has put us all into high speed to try to update all sorts of documents, provisions, etc. And even we are discovering that many of the articles of the legislation have implications that we had not envisaged at the beginning. So it's really caused a, a little earthquake into, into the veterinary division in the sense of the amount of work that we have to do for the implementation date in 2022. Next slide, please. Um, part of this um, of this earthquake, it, it comes from the fact that the legislation, it's very, very, very uh, closely interacting with other bodies, not just the European Medicines Agency. We just put ourselves in the middle for, for convenience, but obviously it's the European Commission, the one that is in charge of the legislation and also who gives us mandates uh, in, in order to support them for the preparation of uh, secondary legislative acts, what we call those uh, um, implementing and delegated acts. And then member states also are doing a great job and, and they are giving us input to the advices, but also the CMDB it's really pro providing a lot of very useful advice, I will say, for the centralized procedures. And I'm not going to detail each of the different activities. You can see it on the screen. But my message is basically it's a very kind of complex process that requires a lot of interaction with many different stakeholders. Um, next slide, please. So what the regulation tries to do, in addition to what I mentioned at the, at the beginning, is uh, to have better ability of veterinary medicines. So the promote the innovation, flexibility of, for example, the, the cascade, and also, for example, an easier import of medicines from uh, other EU member states. And think that, in fact, we are not that involved right now, which is the online, online sales, but I'm sure that once the legislation is implemented, we'll have um, a very strong impact into the use of veterinary medicinal products within the European Union. So if I have the next slide, please. Then the accessibility to information on veterinary medicines is also very important. For us right now in the Union Product Database, it's a very technical issue. So we are discussing internally a lot about what will provide, what will not provide, how, which are the different fields, how can we improve it on the on the later on a later time. But what we shouldn't forget is that this database will provide a lot of centralized information about all the veterinary medicinal products authorized in the European Union. And, and we think that that's going to be very important, that that's going to, in the future, it's going to give us a very modern tool to inform um, the people who need to use veterinary medicinal products, something we didn't have until now. If we go to the next slide, please. Then uh, what I mentioned before, the, the intention is to reduce the risk of antimicrobial resistance. Some people have described antimicrobial resistance as the next pandemic. And we are pleased that the agency is doing, and the member states obviously also are doing a lot of work into the area of antimicrobial resistance. And the, the legislation includes the possibility to restrict the use of certain antimicrobials, which should be restricted for human use and also includes the, uh, restrictions in the use of antimicrobials under the cascade. The preventative use of antimicrobials, it's uh, prohibited, which I think if properly, uh, well, once it's properly implemented, will have impact on how antibiotics are used in animals. And metaphylaxis is only allowed under specific conditions. And, and the last point is the collection of data on the use of antimicrobials, not only at the level of the products, as we are doing until now, uh, as the ASVAC product, 
project is doing until now, but also at farm level. So we are going to have much more granular information on the collection of data on antibiotic use in animals. Next slide, please. The pharmacovigilance system is also changing radically. I'm not going to get into detail into this one because we have later on um, a session on pharmacovigilance and colleagues are much better prepared than myself to report to you which are those changes. So if we can go to the next slide. Um, here you see the status of the major projects. So as you can see, there is a lot of, a lot of activity between 2021 and 2022 with the main intention to deliver by um, January 2022, as I mentioned before. Um, the change management, as you can see at the very bottom, will continue uh, in the, in, during the next years. And that's something that it, it's, it's a procedure we have introduced recently, I will say, formally at least at the veterinary division that it's giving very good results in how we are contacting stakeholders, how we are approaching not only the industry, but also the member states and other stakeholders. Um, on the top of it, you have the provision of legacy product data. And I understand probably that, that you will have some more information later on. But this is uh, taking us a lot of resources. It's the member states now that are full, uh, filling the union product database. And that's some pro a process that it's ongoing. It's not an easy process, but we are managing this, this complex uh, thing. The union pharmacovigilance database is also ongoing. Um, and, and I have an access slide where I provide a bit more of information, the collection of antimicrobial sales and use data. It's ongoing, but the legislation allows us for a bit more of time to start reporting those data. And the manufacturers and wholesales, wholesalers database is, is ongoing also. Next slide, please. So all the advices that we have sent to the European Commission, and just to, to recap, the European Commission has to produce uh, implementing and delegating acts, and then they may ask the, the agency to support them on these activities. So we provide them advice that then and they, uh, they reconsider and convert in, 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 legal piece, uh, in legal pieces. And But all those advices are published on our uh, website. There is, for example, one uh, on oral, oral use that it's not immediately going to result in a delegated and implementing act, but by the end of next year should result in an implementing act. Um, we have work ongoing in two advices, um, and those were depending on the finalization of the criteria for reserving antimicrobials for human use. That's now finalized. One advice is on the list of antimicrobials to be reserved for human use and one advice on the list of substances not to be used or used under certain conditions under the cascade. So next slide, please. So an overview about work that we are doing in other areas. Uh, we are working, for example, in Article 40.5 on data pro protection. And we are, as we speak, we are uh, drafting a reflection paper Obviously, the committee, the CBMP, is the one that provides the scientific advice uh, into those uh, reflections, papers, and guidelines, uh, supported many times by the working parties. But because of the pandemic, in many times, it, we didn't have the working parties fully functioning. So it's been the CBMP, which uh, working remotely, has done an impressive job and provide input, scientific input into those documents. The article 18.7, uh, it's uh, been published for public consultation. This is a reflection paper on potential risks of generics to the environment. The limited markets, and, and my colleague Susan here is going to be talking about that after me, so I'm not going to dwell too much into it, but it's been published uh, after uh, consultation. Uh, then to finalize, maybe to mention that extensive guidance has been produced on immunologicals and efficacy. And although I, I don't want to highlight any specific point of those, the amount of work done on those guidelines, and we're talking about 20, 30 guidelines, have been quite, quite substantial, and it has demanded a lot of resources from part of the agency and obviously the CBMP, as I mentioned before. Next slide, please. 
So on the BMP REG program status, um, and I understand the BMP program status as the kind of IT related part of the BMP REG. Um, as I briefly mentioned before, the manufacturer and wholesale distributor database um, is ongoing and it's on track. The antimicrobial sales and use, it's also ongoing and on track. It's proven to be quite a complex um, and, uh, work. The union product database, um, the legacy data are entering into the production environment. Um, and for the union pharmacovigilance database also, and the work is progressing according to plan. Next slide, please. Um, I also wanted to highlight the work that we have been doing on templates, instructions, and web pages. Maybe that's not that relevant for the SME companies, but I think it's important for you to understand also um, the things that we are trying to do. Basically, we are now finalizing the work on the standard templates. So that includes, and that's really of relevance for you then, um, questions and answer pages that we publish in our web pages and that we are creating and publishing them as we consider appropriate. Um, as you can imagine, there will be a transition period on, during which there will be queries and answers which will remain available on the web page. And, and, and in fact, many times we keep documents as historic documents in our web page. Um, but basically, the message is that we are slowly publishing those uh, queries and answers as we keep progressing into updating our internal documents. Um, we are looking at a number of web pages because all of them need to be updated. That's um, the number of 135 seems to be very specific, but we keep discovering web pages that we need to update to update, even if it is just the legal reference, but also links to other activities, et cetera, and processes that are changing. So it's really demanding in our, in our site. And, and then this is where the change management activities um, to help us, to help the national competent authorities, but also the industry uh, become very important, especially because we are implementing uh, a big number of new IT tools and processes that will help us during the next um, years to, to have a more efficient processing of applications and a more efficient implementation of the legislation. So if I can go to the next slide, please. So, and to summarize, my key messages are, um, even if we kind of um, had to implement the legislation or, or prepare for the implementation of the legislation in a very complex moment, and I want to mention again the pandemic, the fact that we've been teleworking from different parts of Europe during the last month, and we are pleased to be able to come back slowly to the agency, but also the CBMP has been um, remotely working during the last years, which is quite amazing. And in fact, they are coming back during the November CBMP meeting. So next week we are gonna uh, be hosting them again, which we are very glad to, to be able to do. But the scientific guidance is progressing well and in line with the plans that we had which I personally consider a great achievement of my colleagues. Uh, the databases are uh, being developed on track. Uh, obviously, the data needs now to be submitted, and I, I can imagine that there are areas where you know, we will need a bit of work after the implementation that, but, uh, deadline, but we are, we are getting there. Um, we also have um, a number of uh, activities for the industry. I will include also this SME meeting into those activities, uh, which we are ramping up during the last month before the implementation of the legislation. And, and a final remark um, is that the implementation of the regulation is proving complex and demanding on resources for all our stakeholders. I wanted to have a more stronger statement about how difficult this has process has proven to be, but my colleagues suggested that I should, you know, be, be not too overly <laughs> kind of, you know, explicit about the complexity of the of, of the project. And and I think that there is um, what I'm trying to highlight there also is that we are also asking patience from stakeholders because here and there we might need to improve after the implementation of the legislation. We might need to improve one or the other processes, but we are doing our utmost. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jordi, for your, for, um, for your presentation. And now we can move um, uh, with our next speaker, um, Suzanne Thiel. 
uh, who's going to uh, present to um, uh, make a presentation about titled limited markets. What is in, what's in for SMEs? So Suzanne Thiel is a more recent uh, addition to um, to uh, to the EMA uh, uh, staff. So uh, uh, reading her bio. Um, she has a really long, uh, very long experience uh, in the private sector working in uh, uh, European regulatory affairs for veterinary medicinal products. And uh, at EMA, um, she's a scientific officer working on uh, regulatory support and advice for pre and post authorization procedures and uh, also working on uh, the implementation of the veterinary um, uh, legislation. So, Suzanne, I'll give you the floor. Thank you very much. Thank you, Konstantinos. Um, good afternoon, or may be still good morning, uh, and um, welcome again uh, to, to the participants. Um, next slide, please. I, I would like to, to, after a short introduction, um, would like to give a short overview of the legal framework and then um, explain a bit about the work done on the classification, eligibility, and data requirements for limited market products. And um, after that, come to post authorization um, um, uh, and, and work in progress also to, uh, related to the implementation of the limited market um, provisions. And finally, um, give some insight in the transitional measures uh, for moms to, moms to limited market for the, um, as we already realized, uh, the next three months before the new legislation comes in, uh, uh, is applied. Next slide, please. Now, as already uh, said by my, my colleague, uh, Jordi Toron, Toron um, availability of uh, VMPs is, is um, an, a, a, a key topic for the Commission and, and the, the institutions of, of um, the Re European Union and the activities so far for veterinary measured products, especially for limited market, um, will be continued. Um, it started with the um, EMA, EMA Mums Limited Market uh, policy years ago, but this policy will cease to apply. And instead of that, from um, January onwards, we will have uh, a legal basis on limited market products in the in the legislation, which is uh, article which are articles uh, 23 and 24 of Regulation 2019/6. And uh, the uh, EMA CVMP have worked over the last approximately one and a half to two years on the practical implementation for this specific uh, provision of the legislation. Next slide, please. Um, with this slide, please don't don't look at the details at the moment. I, I think if you, you you will have access after the presentation, after the info day to this the presentation, and you could look at the details. Um, there you uh, maybe the most important thing is what I already mentioned. You have now a legal base in the legislation, and where you have to pay pay attention to is for the eligibility. You not only have to uh, provide the evidence that the product is intended for limited market, but you also have to prove the benefit of availability of your particular product. What could be also of interest is that um, there are currently um, no um, reductions in um, data requirements for quality allowed, so the product has to be Annex 2 compliant with regard to, to uh, quality. And you have, which is maybe familiar due to the current situation of renewals, the limited market license will be valid for five ye years, which can be of, uh, uh, renewed. And finally, a comment on the data protection situation. Uh, it's uh, maybe important for you to know that it's n uh, there is no possibility to have a generic of an Article 23 product. Next slide, please. Now, what has been done uh, so far, if it comes to the implementation of the legislation, there are um, um, in basically two main parts, that is classification and eligibility and the data requirements. Uh, I will start with the classification and eligibility of, of limited market products. 
And for this to um, the CVMP has reflected on um, the implementation and developed a reflection paper. Um, this has been uh, published for consultation and has been finally published um, in July this year and which will be, uh, come into effect in, in, in January 2022. Um, um, may, maybe one, one point um, which is not necessarily obvious because this reflection paper has been developed by CVMP and, and EMA, but in close uh, um, uh, cooperation with the CMDV. So even though the in the, the procedure, I come later to that, the CVMP will make an assessment of the uh, classification and eligibility for limited market products. Um, it is uh, applicable or should be applicable for authorizations under the central decentralized and mutual recognition procedure. And also it may be, uh, may be applicable for national um, um, applications if um, are requested. Next slide, please. Um, the objectives of the um, um, exercise, um, which is, is written down in the, the uh, reflection paper, is to, um, on the one hand, to allow for the authorization of products um, as a limited market, which are intended to treat a serious or life-threatening disease or condition or, are con or uh, products which are considered to fulfill an unmet medical need. And for those products, if this is confirmed, um, the absence of some confirmatory data for safety and efficacy um, shall be uh, applicable. A second objective, and this is where I come later um, to this, uh, this, uh, this as well, because um, additional work uh, will be done on that is that it has been decided by CVMP that the regulatory system should also continue to issue marketing authorizations for type of products that is being authorized now under the current limited market MUMS policy. Next slide, please. Um, this is again a bit of a, a busy um, overview, but it may help you to understand the um, decisions which has to be make, made um, before a product can be classified for as a limited market or for eligibility. In principle, it is a two-step process um, where on the one hand, it has to be checked whether a product has a limited market classification as per definition of Article 429. And the second uh, step is uh, whether the uh, benefit of availability of the product for the market is met. Um, in the next slides, I will go a bit in, into de uh, more into detail um, on, on these two questions which needs to be answered. Next slide, please. Um, with regard to the first question, whether a product is classified as, as limited market, um, there is Article 429, uh, which has to be looked at. And um, Section B of this article is quite straightforward because it is um, clearly indicated uh, what species um, are uh, limited markets. Um, the next, uh, the, the other um, provision is a bit more complicated because it, it looks um, on the um, whether a VMP for the treatment or prevention of diseases that occur infrequently or in uh, limited geographical areas um, uh, can be uh, proven as positive. And this is then for the species which are not covered under um, article, um, uh, under the, the, the B section. Um, for these diseases um, uh, which occur infrequently or limited geographical areas, there will be an um, uh, estimated potential size of the market um, um, uh, necessary. And this um, we have developed for this um, uh, an equation um, based on which it can be uh, calculated. The equation is included in the reflection paper and the uh, some additional information on, on 
uh, on more details is also included there. Please be aware of the uh, guidance threshold put in the reflection paper for species populations. It is for vaccines 5% and for other treatments 0.5%. These figures are based on the, um, um, I could can almost say, historical experience of the, of the EMA policy. So they are not coming out of the blue, but, but are um, rooted in, in these experience. Next slide, please. Um, with regard to the que second question on benefit of uh, availability, which is linked to the provision um, of the uh, limited market um, article 23, uh, the provision A, there are um, two, two criteria which have to be uh, uh, fulfilled. Um, the first one that is already um, uh, mentioned uh, has already been mentioned. The product is intended to treat um, a serious or life-threatening disease condition or address an unmedical need, and the absence of uh, certain documentation, um, which is usually required for a, a full license, uh, uh, can can be accepted. Um, for, for this product. So the benefit of availability is a crucial point here. And as already said, this is an um, additional step which has to be fulfilled compared to the current um, EMA policy. Next slide, please. Um, now I'm coming to the, to the procedure, the process for classifying um, a product or a, uh, uh, making a determination of the eligibility. Um, the link to um, the document developed and already published is, is um, uh, at the bottom of this slide in, in blue, so you can access that. In fact, it is a two-step process which allows for a separate de de determination of the limited status under Article 429 and in the second step for the confirmation of eligibility for an Article 23 marketing authorization application. The CVMP will be, will um, on, on request, um, look into the um, um, application by, by, by the applicant and um, will, will evaluate the, the, the application um, and, and conform, confirm hopefully in the end um, classification and or eligibility um, it is expected that um, this application will be made in advance of, of a marketing authorization application because the, um, you, you as an applicant would, leak, uh, would like to need, uh, have some, some clarity on the data required for an application. The um, um, confirmation uh, will be um, uh, valid for a period of five years and this period uh, will be renewable. Next slide, please. Um, alongside the um, work on the classification and eligibility, uh, so the, more the regular, regulatory part um, for, for the limited market applications, the uh, data requirements um, for the limited market products uh, have been uh, developed. Um, so that means um, that the MUMS guidelines um, with the um, cessation of the EMA policy will uh, cease to apply and we, uh, from 20, uh, 28th of January 2022, the guidelines developed, which are um, guideline on data requirements for IVMPs and for non-IVMPs, which also cover biological products, um, will be applicable we have one guideline for IVMPs and two for non-IVMPs, which cover the latter cover effic on the one hand efficacy and target animal safety, and on the other hand safety and residue data. As um, the reflection paper, these guidelines um, have been uh, published for consultation and were, were um, finally published in July 2021. Next slide, please. Um, the, this is 
um, the, the um, pre, pre, uh, uh, post authorization uh, steps. So if you have gained a limited market application, um, as already uh, said, the, market, uh, the limited market uh, authorization is valid for a period of five years. And you are able to uh, renew this uh, marketing authorization um, if a positive benefit risk uh, assessment uh, can be confirmed, confirmed by the CVMP. Um, in the uh, reflection paper, you can also find some information on the um, uh, considerations um, which are um, important for the decision to extend the validity. And this is, uh, on the one hand, the acceptability of the safety profile, including um, information to LEE, so classical pharmacovigilance um, information. Um, the second one is whether a product continues to satisfy the criteria of the uh, classification, as um, which is in principle comparable with the first step pre-authorization. -author and uh, whether the, uh, special uh, the special medical need of the product is still met. Next slide, please. Um, as promised, I'm, I'm also coming to the uh, work in product, uh, in progress, uh, sorry. Um, and with this, I come to the sec uh, I, I repeat the second uh, uh, obje objective of the implementation of Article 23, that the um, the regulatory system should continue to be able to issue marketing authorizations um, as it has been for MUMS limited market products under the uh, uh, um, EMA policy until now. These are then, uh, to be clear about that, and if you go later back to the um, decision tree, these are the products which are um, which comply with uh, the classification, so they are limited market products, but they do not comply with the second step, um, with the um, eligibility for Article 23. So, um, but the CVMP uh, decided that um, some work should be done on this, and a concept paper on the development of scientific guidance was published for consultation on 15th uh, October, and the consultation phase will end on um, in two months' time, or a bit less, on 15th of the de December uh, this year. Next slide, please. Again, very busy and not 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 easily to 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 grasp. What I would like to highlight here is um, what we would like to achieve is to define, as it has been done under the MUMS policy. Um, for limited market pro product, products, the options for flexibility within Annex 2. And this is an important point compared to what is now um, possible for an Article 23 application where deviations from Annex 2 are possible for safety and efficacy. So the work to be done is to define the flexibility within Annex 2 for all three criteria, efficacy, safety, and quality for all type of products, non-IVMPs, uh, non-IVMPs, and also the um, biological products. If it comes to quality, these quality, flexible uh, quality requirements within Annex 2 will then also be applicable for Article 23 products. I know this is a lot of information. This is what, what, what I would like to bring to you in a nutshell. But um, please have a look at the concept paper, uh, um, draft concept paper published for consultation. Um, there are more information can be gathered and we are very happy to receive your comments on, these, uh, on this concept paper. Next slide, please. Um, now, that is, I think, my, my last slide. It's uh, about the transition uh, from the MUMS uh, policy to limited markets. Um, on on uh, January 2022, the current MUMS pol uh, policy will cease to, to apply. And um, with this, the, the new regulation comes into force. Products classified as MUMS under the current policy 
um, which haven't received um, a marketing authorization or where, where no marketing authorization application has been validated before uh, 28th of, of, of January will have to be reconsidered in light of the provisions of uh, regulation uh, of the new uh, regulation. So you have to go through the, the um, application process for classification and eligibility as described uh, earlier. Um, if you have, um, uh, however, um, an, uh, filed a uh, an application which has been validated, it will be processed under the current legislation and not uh, the, the new one. Um, and finally, products classified currently as mums and are already authorized will be considered as standard or full marketing authorizations and the new regulation will not affect the authorization status. That's all I would like to, to present to you at the moment. Thank you very much for your intention and I think in the next session you have the possibility to, to ask questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Suzanne, for this excellent presentation and helping us navigate the uh, the changes and the transition in um, that are um, impacted by the uh, the new uh, legislation. Well, welcome everyone to uh, this afternoon's uh, session. Um, we'll start with a, a session on uh, post authorization uh, pharmacovigilance, uh, where we will see two presentations and the first. Uh, Part of the afternoon will be presented by uh, Jos Olarts. Jos has been working with the agency for a long time in veterinary pharmacovigilance. He's a veterinarian by training uh, and uh, he's uh, the best in a position to present to give you the latest updates on changes in pharmacovigilance, signal detection and surveillance. Jos, you've got the floor. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you very much. Ivo, Ivo, can I also ask you please to introduce Laura quickly because we have a joint presentation and we will move uh, from myself to Laura and then back to myself. Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much. No, that I'll, I'll happy to do that. Uh, uh, Laura, uh, as Jos has just told us, will uh, share this presentation uh, with Jos. Uh, she will provide us with an introduction to the Union Pharmacovigilance Database. Uh, Laura graduated as a biologist and she has been working with the agency for the past 21 years. Started on the human uh, side, but then later on moved to the veterinary side and has been working with us uh, for a long time. And uh, is uh, from the business side uh, responsible for the development of the EVVET system, as well as PSUR and signal management processes. Uh, you've got the floor, both of you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much. First slide, please. Thank you. Next slide. Okay, so we all know that pharmacovigilance post authorization in general has significant changes coming up with the new um, legislation on how we're going to operate pharmacovigilance in the EU. And I assume that the audience, probably few of you have the really inside uh, detail already or have, have been part of the discussions, although we have and we have involved uh, the industry with many stakeholders meetings in the last year and a half, I think. But probably in terms of SMEs, you are less close to pharmacovigilance than than um, than larger companies that have access to to sometimes small groups that only dedicated in, in pharmacovigilance. So my the objective today is to give you first start to give you an overview of the main changes. And then uh, Laura will continue and give you a little bit more detail. The idea is at the end that you have a better understanding of the changes that probably are required, required for your own systems so that you can also make that transition. We have a large uh, slide deck. We will have to run to a number of slides very quickly probably, but they're there for your reference. The last slide is very important. That includes the training dates and the trainings. They will start very soon in three weeks time. And we have a number of training dates in November, December and January coming up where you also are invited. Um, okay, next slide. No, sorry, 
I'm staying with this slide first. Yeah, so the reference documents for us on pharmacovigilance, of course, the legislation. Then we have the implementing regulation, which was finalized and published uh, during the summer. And on the basis of those two documents, we have developed the, the guidelines on veterinary good pharmacovigilance practice. There are five main guidelines, one on collection of reports, one on signal management, one on inspections, one on communications, and one on PSMF. And all those documents, they were out for consultation uh, until September. We have been finalizing them, taking into account the comments. And uh, next week, they're there for final adoption by CVMP and CMDV, and they will be published very shortly. At the same time, we're working on the processes that um, that we need to run these new uh, pharmacovigilance requirements and the training is also being prepared as, as i've just said next slide please <clears throat> so this is this is the the main summary slide from my side and let me go give me a moment to go over that with you together so the pillars of pharmacovigilance, some of them have changed, some of them uh, are still the same. The first one I would say is really very much the same as currently you're, you you should be very familiar with is the day-to-day the -day collection of adverse event report and sending it to uh, user vigilance. So that work in, in essence has not really changed. There are some details there. Uh, for example, you would not collect uh, any longer the non-serious just for your PSURs. Now you just collect any report and you would be sending it to the central database. And you have 30 days instead of the 15 days previously for the serious cases. So again, all reports, no difference anymore between non-serious and serious, and 30 days for submission. What is, what is new um, and what was a requirement from the member states, as part of your current PSURs, you're submitting your sales data. So that has been maintained uh, as a yearly requirement. And the objective there is that we then can calculate also the incidence rates, which is necessary for signal management. We come that, to that a little bit later. But we have, we have more time as, as regulators, we have more time to implement these incidents. We have uh, two additional years still uh, the end of 23 to implement that part. But yearly sales are coming into effect normally immediately um, for companies as well. So the second part is the main change. The second bullet point there is continuous adverse event analysis by, by the companies. It's called signal management. So where you are collecting your adverse event reports, you would at the same time, and that can all, all be read then in the guidelines that we will be published in a couple of weeks, you would then use those reports to identify if there is any signal uh, appearing that might affect the benefit risk balance of your product. In that case, if there is a change in benefit risk, for example, you have to update your SPC, then there's a 30-day requirement to submit uh, that proposal. So all these, the details of this is outlined in, in, the, in the guidelines and we'll give a little bit more uh, details with, with Laura and myself later on. But so that's the main change. Continuously, besides the fact that uh, you would be recording your adverse event, there is no longer requirement on PSURs, but at the same time, when you have data coming in, when you have a lot of data coming in, you are required to consider if any of this data consists a signal. Now, part of this exercise, once you have uh, identified a signal, you can upload that signal into a, a database, into Udravigens Pharmacovigens database, into um, a module that we, that we are about to create. Um, part of that, those submissions by the end, once a year, and that's the other big requ new requirement I would say in single management is that you have to uh, you have to submit two statements. It's actually two tick boxes in the system where you um, confirm on a yearly basis that you have first of all you have done and you have followed the guidelines on single management, and secondly you then confirm that your benefit risk uh, for that particular product is still the same. So independently, whether you have any reports or whether you have any signals, 
every year you have to have those statements ticked off. So we have tried to minimize that work, but it's the yearly event. So in the beginning, once you have a new product on the market, you will probably have work with some <clears throat> with some reports, um, perhaps some signals. So you will have to submit the signals and the statement a few years down the line, maybe three years already. Once it has uh, stabilized, you know already the, the, the statements you need, uh, the warnings in your SPC. You have very little reports coming in, no new signals. The only thing that you would still have to do then is those uh, statements, but as tick boxes in that new system. So that's, that's in a nutshell, um, the new requirement on signal management. What is the oversight of the regulators, the competent authorities, the HSC, the commission? The, the control of it will be done uh, through farm vigilance inspections. So there's a lot of uh, thrust being put on the companies. Uh, there's gonna also be a risk-based signal surveillance by the regulators. So we're setting up, we're trying to set up a small group of experts that would be reviewing continuously also the data in utero vigilance to see if any obvious signals are in there and then take necessary action if necessary and take the action if necessary and that uh, group are also the regulators they have also by legislation article 81 they have the opportunity to do ad hoc targeted targeted surveillance as well so the the oversight is <laughs> directly on the database but uh, inspecting um the, the companies directly. <coughs> and the basis for the inspections, apologies, is the last bullet point is the master file. It's the, that is the current DDPS. So the master file is a file where you as a company will describe all your, um, the complete system that you have in place on pharmacovigilance. It would include a new element of quali quality management system. And that's brought in because the whole system of farm provisions is relying really on a trust basis on the companies. So you would have to prove at inspections that you have the system, those SOPs really in place, that you are capable of following up your product when on recording the data, on doing the database queries, on submitting the signals. So that's the, the basis <coughs> uh, from a company perspective to be in line with um, with the new legislation and, and the requirements. The Farmers Witness Master File is um, a file that is kept at the premises of the company and it also makes it easier for you to amend it as you go. And, and uh, it's not that, um, so it does not require whenever you want to update it, uh, specific variations. <coughs> Next slide, please. So again, we're going from a time-based, which was the PSUR-based uh, system, to really a database system where the data will dictate the amount of work that you have. After a few years, normally you should have still have some reports. If you have a good selling product, you will have reports coming in and inevitably. But apart from submitting those reports, if you have a stable pharmacovigilance profile, if your SPC is stable, you should not have much more than the annual statements to do and your sales submission. So that's the, the main change. The fact that we go into a database system, of course, we need to have good data systems. And that's the next slide. <coughs> Sorry, it's not COVID, it's just my throat. Um, just briefly, we the main uh, new element also of legislation is and it's very important for our data in pharmacovigilance is to, to have the product data available so that we can query the database. The product database, and uh, Jana will have in the next session much more details, but it contains from the pharmacovigilance part also QPPV data and the reference of the PSMF file. <coughs> Then we have the main um, Union Pharmacovigilance database. So it's the current Tudor Vigilance veterinary that is being updated. And Laura will shortly give you a glance of, of what are the, the, the changes. So that's the new layout and, and other changes that's now gonna be compliant with VICH. 
So that database is being used to, as now, to collect all the reports. And at the same time, it's your access to uh, review the data and to do the analysis. Now, I say it's your access. We assume that particularly SMEs will probably more likely to use the central database for single management than the larger companies. The larger companies by legislation are allowed to, well, any company is allowed to use your own database for your single management. But, um, but I assume that many SMEs would not have access to such, such facilities. So what we will do in the training, of course, the trainings are there to, to show you how you can access your own data and how you can query the database um, to comply with to comply with the single management requirements. Then that's the last bit, the single management reporting module. Whenever you have a signal, you need to submit it. The same as the annual statement. And also this system is being put in place um, to deal with any other alerts that needs to be circulated between the regulators, but also if necessary from a company-based uh, point of view. So these are the three main systems that we, that will, um, support the overall system of uh, pharmacovigilance and the processes under the new regulation. Next slide. So, so briefly, something about the burden, because uh, there's lots being said that we should, and that's the, one of the main objectives of new legislation, we, cho we should limit the administrative burden, which we had identified came with the PSURs. Um, and the main object, the main way we hopefully will achieve this is by making sure that we have a risk-based approach where, as I said before, where the data uh, will dictate the amount of work that you have. So normally after a few years, you should be left only with your statements and your, your reporting. That should be the, ba the main gain for the company so that you don't, <clears throat> that, um, you have work, of course, when you have reports and when you have signals, that is absolutely normal. But for products where you have limited reports, products that are long time on the market, you should have not much of um, of work to do just just uh, to ensure that that you 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 follow the um, the guidelines and submit your annual statements. Having said that, this red line is still going up over 2022 because it's. It's inevitable that we're now still in the phase where we're setting up our systems, we're setting up our new, our new processes. We're gonna have the trainings um, inevitably for a lot of products, uh, and particularly the non-caps, because for the centrally authorized products, we have already about eight, nine years experience of signal detection, so we know them much better. But for the non-caps, they, they will be for the first time a signal detection. They will have a lot of signals coming up that are often uh, not true signals, but that's inherent to, to the system. So in the first year, we will have more work. It's just, um, that's the nature of the beast. I think the expectation is once we're at cruising speed, hopefully into next year, that's when we expect to, to have the first gains, hopefully in, in lesser burden. And now I give the floor to um, Laura to have a, give you a bit of a flavor of the different systems and, and uh, please, Laura, go ahead. So, in my part of the presentation, I will briefly mention the main differences between Volume 9B and the new legislation with regards to adverse event reporting to the Utah Vigilance Veterinary. Then I will give an overview of the new reporting application that just has to mention that we have been developing. And also, I will introduce you to the data warehouse dashboards, which are the tools that you will have access to and they are designed to be used to facilitate data analysis. And if we go to the next slide, please. So with regards to the main differences between uh, volume 90 and the new legislation, just has already mentioned some of them. So for example, the 30 days calendar reporting for all adverse event reports. So there is no differences between serious and non-serious adverse events for the reporting obligation. 
However, uh, with regards to the system, it is worth mentioning that the field series is mandatory in the PICH guidelines. So we have to implement it in the system. And what we are going to do is provide some guidance during the trainings on how to complete this uh, field because you will have to. So the guidance is to use the definition of series provided in the BICH guideline, and we will include that on the training slides. Uh, with regards to lack of efficacy, what has changed is that now the off-label cases need also to be reported, and for environmental incidents, there is a new definition that hopefully clarifies what constitutes environmental incidents to be reported. And you can find the definition in the glossary for the, of the guideline on our precedent reporting. And with regard to the requirement related to the medicinal products for human use that may have been administered to an animal, uh, this requirement doesn't really apply to marketing authorization holders as much. Uh, the only requirement is that we would report the information on this product as much as their other concomitant product that you may mention in your report. And if we go to the next slide, please. So this is this slide, I will go quickly over it, is just to emphasize the new reporting flow. So the primary reporter would report the adverse event to either the MCA or the marketing authorization holder, who will then send the report to Utrecht Regional Veterinary, to the central database. And all organizations will have access to the data in EBVET according to the access policy. And I will mention some more information about the access policy later. And if we go to the next slide, please. And there is some animations there. So we'll now go on to the system. So I will give you an introduction to the new reporting tool. To access the UDRA vigilance, you need to be registered. And the organization sign users that are currently registered with uh, the TVBED do not need to be registered. We are migrating that information. So uh, you will not need to register to use the new tool if you are already registered. And if we go to the next slide, please. So this gives you a uh, first look of what the new application will look like. Uh, the system will allow you to create reports, validate them, and send them to EBVET. And then in another part of the application, you will also be able to search for reports and messages that have been sent to the system, and you can use various criteria to search for the reports. I've got a slide later on to show you briefly how this will look like. And the, as we mentioned earlier, the reporting form follows the VICH guidelines. So it includes all the fields from the VICH guidelines and is divided into sections. The mandatory fields are highlighted in red, as you can see there, and they have an asterisk next to them. So you can easily identify them. And if we go to the next slide, please. So one, there is only one form to submit a precedent reports, unlike in the previous EBV2, uh, because humans are now considered a species. So if you have an advertisement report in humans, you will select the species human in there. And if we go to the next slide, so here are other sections from the reporting form. So you can report information on the medicinal products, and this is repeatable, so you can enter as many products as you need. And there is a section to describe the information on the report and code the adverse events into better terms. And if we go to the next slide, 
you can see that uh, the PICH guideline, when you count the adverse events into Vedra Tank, it will allow you to enter how many animals uh, suffer that adverse event. So you will be able to enter much more accurate information. And if you, the system also allows you to state the accuracy of the information. So you can enter whether the information was actual or estimated. Next slide, please. And the last part I'm going to show in the reporting form is, uh, for example, you can also include whether the product was used off-label and state the off-label. And then we can move on to the next slide. This where I can show you that you will be able to search for reports and messages based on quite a lot of number of criteria. And uh, when the adverse event reports that meet the criteria are reported, the level of access that you will have to the information on the reports will depend on the access policy. So if you send the report, you have access to all the fields. If one of your products is, are, is mentioned in the report, you will have what is called level two access to the information. So you will have access to most of the fields in the report, including the case narrative. However, if you don't own any of the products in the, mentioned in the report, you will have access to some fields of the report, but not to others, like, for example, the case now. We will cover this information in full during the training, so uh, we will provide much more information with regards to searches, this policy, and other information uh, on how to report adverse event reports using this tool. And then we can move on to the next Live. And in the next part of the presentation, I will give you an introduction to the dashboards that we've created for data analysis. So, the, on the next slide, please, uh, if you click through, I think it'll be best uh, again, 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 until we get to the last one there. So we have created eight dashboards and reports that allow you to do different things. So depending what kind of information you want to find out, you will use one, one dashboard or another. And I will briefly go through all of them. Uh, the adverse event overview dashboard does Simply that it allows you to get a simple overview of the data for a product or substance or for a group of products, for example, based on the ATC that code. And I'm going to show you some screenshots later of how this uh, dashboard looks like and the kind of data you can obtain with it. The next one we have there is the signal detection dashboard. So this has been optimized to try to skew the data for products or substances and in order to check for potential signals. So it contains the statistical indicator, the ROR, to help you uh, identify some potential signals. And if you have a lot, if you've identified a potential signal using this dashboard, you can access the information like a line listing and the actual case reports from it. But if you have a lot of data and you want to analyze the signal further based on certain parameters such as age, the time to onset, the geographical distribution, uh, the pharmaceutical form, and so on, there is a dashboard there, which is the signal evaluation bit. The dashboard that will allow you to do that. Uh, with regards to the data stratification dashboard, I won't go into detail of it because it's much more complex and we will cover that during the trainings. But uh, it, it allows you to 
compare products and instead of uh, comparing one product to all the other products in the database, it allows you to narrow the query to, for example, the same type of products or to remove a product from view if it's causing uh, problems with the calculation of the statistical indicators. Then we put a, a line listing uh, report where you can obtain a basic line listing for which includes all the cases for a product, substance, or group of products. And we've also created a new tool, uh, which is only on the inception. So at the moment, it is it's quite basic, but it is uh, tailored to monitor the data for some for, for a marketing authorization holder or uh, the NCAs. Uh, if you you will select the name of your organization and a very brief period of time, and it will allow you to monitor the data that has been received for your products in the system during that period of time to allow you to continuously monitor the data for potential signals. And in the next uh, screenshots, I will show you how some of those dashboards look like. So if we go to the next slide, please. Okay, so we will start with the adverse event overview dashboard that, uh, as I mentioned before, allows you to obtain baseline data for a product or substance. So next slide, please. And most of the dashboards work uh, in the same way. You've got a set of prompts or filters where you select uh, the information for the product or substance that you want to find and apply some conditions. And then you will obtain results based on the conditions that you apply when you set your parameters. So in this one, for example, on the first uh, prompt, you will select either a product or a substance or a group of products based on its preferred code. Then on the next one, you select a time frame and uh, you select where you want to view data for animal reports, human reports, or both. And if we go to the next slide, please. you will obtain an overview of the data for the product that you selected. So on the first set of data at the top, you have the total number of places listed for the product uh, during the period of time that you selected, the number of animals affected, how many of these reports included fatal cases, and how many animals died. And then the information is broken down the region on the left hand side on the pie chart for the specified period. And then on the right hand side, you've got information for the full data set. And at the bottom, you've got uh, another set of graphs showing you the information per year for the number of cases and the number of fatal cases. And if we move on to the next slide, please. So in this report as well, you can get information, an information breakdown of the number of cases by species and federal. And uh, the information is shown at SOC level to start with, but you can go up and down the federal hierarchy. And at the bottom of the slide, you can see that there are links to other reports and uh, that you can click and it will take you to, for example, the signal detection report, or to see more details. So if we go to the next slide, you will see the information that you get when you click on the see details link. And uh, the system will present you with an overview for species of the data for your product they break him broken down by various parameters. I will not go into details here. We will cover this during the relevant trainings. 
but this is just to give you a flavor of the type of information you can get with these dashboards. And let's go to the next slide, please. And now on the next, I'm sorry, set of slides, I will briefly show you the report, the dashboard that has been optimized for signal detection, and then I will hand over to Josh to present you with the principles. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, yes, all the way, please. So I will present you now with the signal detection dashboard and the signal evaluation. So if we go to the next slide, please, in the interest of time. So the signal detection dashboard works as the previous one. You will select your parameters in this screen, and then if you click on the tab to obtain the results, uh, please uh, go to the next slide. The first tab will show you an overview of the geographical distribution of the data for the product or substance you selected. And at the bottom, you can see a table with the information broken up by country. And on the links shown where, with the number of cases, you can access a line listing. And if we go to the next slide, please. Uh, this will show you the breakdown of the information for the cases. So the first set of data shows you the information for the time period you selected with the cumulative ROR. And then the next set of data will show you the data prior to the period that you selected. So you can see the effect that the new data had on the whole data set. And if we move on to the next slide, uh, I won't uh, go too much into details here, but this will allow you to see what data uh, went into calculating the ROR for the federal term in question that we are seeing there. So you can see what numbers were used to compile the calculation. Next slide, please. And for the signal evaluation uh, dashboard, I will, if you go to the next slide, please. As I mentioned before, this will allow you to evaluate a signal in depth. So it will show you the data uh, very broken down by various parameters. As you can see, they are by time to onset, by off-label use. Uh, then you can see age, weight, species and breed, and so on. And if we go to the next uh, slide, uh, you see the product, for example, has various pharmaceutical forms. You can see the data broken down by pharmaceutical form and geographical distribution. Next slide, please. You can see whether any other products were administered with that product. And if we move on, please, to the slide. And you can see what other federal terms were reported in the same. Next slide, please. And I pass now over to Josh to continue explaining the approach to signal management. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Laura. So, because I realized when you do a lot of these slides and we run through them, it might look, I'm pretty sure, overwhelming. And what is this all about? And so the next slides are a little bit to bring it back down to earth and to make it more real, maybe. Um, so you will, first of all, like I explained earlier, you would have your reports that you have sent. And then the reports will be looked at into in your queries as cumulative uh, over the life cycle of, um, of your product. So contrary to the PSURs where you have where you looked back over a specific time frame, your signals would be essentially evaluated if you if you suspect that a certain event is really 
potentially related to your product, you would start analyzing this over the whole life cycle of your product. So that's the main advantage of your product, of your database that you have access and that you can visualize those data from, from the start of a, a product going to market to, um, to the point that you analyze. So we have a definition of a signal, which is exactly the same um, definition that is being used on the, on the human side. Um, so I'll just maybe read it quickly. A signal is defined as information that arises from multiple sources, which suggests the potential new causal association um, or a new aspect of a known causal association between intervention and an adverse event. And this is judged likely to justify further investigation. So that's the, the one that is part of the implementing regulation as well. So the focus of signals will be to identify new information. It's important that to emphasize that signals are a hypothesis. So often because they're observational data, it's, it is anyway very difficult to define a causal association. So they're a hypothesis. And, and it's important to, to also to point out that very many signals do not represent the risk or require further regulatory actions. Many signals, and that's unfortunate, but that's just part that we le learned that from the human side as well. Many signals are false positive. So next slide. Next slide. So I'm not going into the detail of this, but it shows you that there, there is gonna be a, a there are options in the methodology that's outlined in the guideline, but but during the training, we will address them, how these can be used in helping you identify whether there's really a, a causal link between the observed events and your product. Next slide. Uh, this is a slide that highlights, and and you have to read it, it's, it's coming out of the guideline that you will, that's gonna be available in two weeks normally. It, it highlights that part of the signal is prioritization, there, there's a detection part, and then you have different outcomes. Sometimes you have an emerging safety issue, very rare, and then you can have um, signals that would lead to a change of benefit risk, so a 30-day submission. You have signals that would that you would identify as, okay, I need to now start close monitoring, and um, some signals may require uh, a an, an posterization safety study. But this is coming out in the guideline. I, I just invite you to read it and it should be clear there. Next slide. One other main element for us uh, for the risk-based approach and to help you prioritizing is that we have agreed on a subset of FEDRA uh, terms, so a subset of what we call medically important events. So these are events, it's outlined in the guideline again, that you um, cannot ignore, basically. You have to pay attention whenever you have a report coming in with any of these, of these events. You have to treat them seriously and uh, follow the guidelines and making sure that you, that you look at them as a potential signal. So that's the objective of this limited number of, of terms. And, and, and it's important to say it's a limited number because they, we followed the kind of approach like on the human side, but in the human side, we're talking about hundreds of terms of matter terms. And we have, I think we have tried to limit it to, to a, a workable uh, group of, of terms. Next slide. Um, one are important aspect that we are currently still debating on and how to advise companies further on how frequent should you be monitoring because that's going to be one of the main bases for your risk-based approach. It should be data-driven, but it should also be normally how long is your um, product on the market, how stable is your profile. So this is identified already in the Commission Implementing Regulation, but we are hoping to have more details in the guidelines that will help you prioritizing on the risk-based approach. Next, next slide. 
Um, next slide. I'm gonna shift now a little bit quicker. One more next slide. I think what's important to finish off in terms of signal management that at the end of the day, your clinical judgment is remains the most important one. So the tools that you will have available, they will look uh, overwhelming for the moment, but they will just be tools that help you to identify and to prioritize at the end of the day. And we learned that also from the human side, you will end up going to the individual reports that you think are of good quality. You will start reading the um, the narratives, and on the basis of the narratives, you will you will use your veterinary clinical judgment to see if you believe that there is evidence of any potential causal relationship between your product and the events observed. And for some of them, it's going to be easy: injection site reaction, anaphylactic type of reactions, the ones that occur fairly soon after the the after product this is given but rare events long term effects when you have a lot of concomitant products when there is an underlying disease we know that this is this is not an easy science and we're dealing always with observational data so that's that has not changed the tools will help you screening the data more easily but the assessment itself is very much the same assessment as you are doing now on the individual events. Next slide. And so just reference to the guideline that will be released shortly on signal management. Next slide. And I wanna, this is about the two statements um, for your reference. So these are gonna be presented in the system as two takeoff boxes on an annual basis. You just go to the system for your product. And if you have complied with the guidelines, you take them off and that should be um, normally your annual exercise in terms of the annual statement submissions. Next slide. Next slide, two more um, minutes maybe to say something about pharmacovigilance system and PSMF. Um, for <clears throat> an SME, I think it's it's still important that to read those guidelines that particularly on the quality management system. So inevitably, because we're putting a lot of trust on continuous assessment by the companies, there is a part where you would have to make sure that you can show whenever you have an inspection coming that you have the systems in place, that you follow the guidelines, that you are in a position to monitor the data appropriately. So these are important um, guidelines for you to review. Next slide. Mm, next slide, it's all for reference. I think here we just, this slides give you the the, tran the transition of the DDPS, which has basically already similar information on your overall system to the PSMF. So we're talking almost about the same documents, um, but now with an addition of a quality management system. Next slide. And the, and the next two slides, I think they give you just the overview of uh, already detailed information that you can find in the guidelines itself. Um, maybe I'd like to end saying that coming back to the fact that we are we are really in a transition period, um, yourselves as well as 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 ourselves as well. So we we are always there to support you, particularly the small and, and medium. So don't hesitate. Send us your questions, and based on your questions, I think we can. Also consider maybe if we see the, the same questions coming back to publish uh, questions and answers that might help you uh, to go into the, that transition. For the systems that are not entirely ready, we're working on workaround procedures. We do this actually together with the stakeholders, with the industry. We have regular stakeholder meetings where we exchange views on how to best uh, process and uh, because we're all in the same boat, this is a new system, it's a new way of operating, and uh, it might look overwhelming, but 
don't hesitate to contact us with, with any of your questions. And the last slide then is to brings you back to the dates one more. <clears throat> yeah, the dates of the training. Please consider this. Whether you think you want to participate, you're very much invited to the different trainings uh, that are focused on any on the, the aspects on pharmacovigilance reporting, signal management. Um, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Jos and uh, Laura, for uh, uh, bringing us this uh, presentation. And it is indeed a lot of information that needs to be processed. So I can only recommend that uh, people do subscribe and attend those uh, trainings and take the opportunity to send us questions in order to get more clarity on uh, the processes at hand. Um, thank you also for uh, not taking too much time, uh, Jos. Uh, um, I think you've overshoot it by four minutes, so that's that's manageable for a chair as well. Uh, and with that, I would like to I would like to move to the next presentation. And there's an opportunity at the end of the session to to ask questions. Uh, the next presentation will be on the Union Product Database, and again, it will be a joint presentation uh, between uh, this time uh, the business and uh, IT that is involved in the development of that UT uh, Union Product Database. Uh, Jana Shalansky, who will be representing the business. She is the uh, program uh, manager uh, for all the projects that run under the VMP REC. Um, and she is the head of the uh, Veterinary Strategic Support Office in the Veterinary Medicines. She's been with the agency since 2003 and has worked in different areas in the Veterinary Medicines Division. So she knows about uh, all of it. Um, and she will present together with uh, Anna Vicente, um, who joined the agency in 2019 and who's representing the IT side. And she's been focusing ever since she joined us. She's a business analyst. She focuses on uh, gathering and analyzing requirements for delivering solutions, um, also actively with marketing authorization holders and competent authorities. So uh, I would like to give the floor to you, and I trust that the presentation will land uh, perfectly well uh, for what is needed at this moment. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Ivo. Um, and uh, we can uh, start straight away with the next slide. Thank you. Um, so just to give a quick overview, um, as Ivo mentioned, between uh, me and Anna, we are going to give you uh, some uh, program and project context on the Union Product Database and the status of where we are at this point in time. And then Anna is going to also give you a little demonstration of uh, the functionalities for MAHs. Next slide, please. Um, so for the context, I, I'm sure um, my colleagues have spoken about it today already uh, several times. So obviously we have the new regulation. Um, that has uh, all the purposes listed on, on this slide, uh, so we can move straight to the next one. Thank you. Um, and in terms of the timeline, uh, this is uh, certainly a timeline that put pressure on us for the Union Product Database. We are um, almost at the end of the implementation period, so um, it will become applicable on the 28th of January 22. This is when we have to have the Union Product Database also available um, and usable for everybody who has uh, responsibilities there. Um, so we are getting there. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so in terms of the implementation, um, the, the program we have uh, um, initiated there or that has been going on for, for two years now is um, mainly focused on the IT systems that have to be developed or um, updated uh, to comply with the new regulation. And you can see the overview of those um, different IT systems here. So um, what this picture is supposed to illustrate is that as far as possible across all systems, we will try to use uh, master data, so um, controlled vocabularies that have been standardized and um, 
uh, so that the the information that, for example, is collected in the Union Product Database can be used in other systems as well, and we don't have to maintain, for example, product information in um, uh, separately again in the pharmacovigilance system or in a system that collects antimicrobial sales and use data. Um, at the bottom, you can also see um, uh, just a rough outline really on the information from the different systems that will be made public, uh, either uh, from the 28th of January or later on in the case of incidence data, it will be later and the antimicrobial data reporting will also be um, made available uh, after 22. Next slide, please. Um, so then if we, if we focus in on the Union Product Database, the objectives for that um, database that come from the legislative requirements that you may be aware of from the regulation and also the Associated Commission Implementing Regulation are um, listed here. So we want for once uh, a common database uh, to have information on veterinary medicinal products. Um, that information should also be, of course, available to individual users and other IT systems. Um, and that also includes information on the availability of uh, specific veterinary medicinal products. Um, as I mentioned before, we use as much as possible structured data and controlled vocabularies. Um, and this is mainly to improve the data quality and regulatory processes in general. And also, uh, it allows the integration of the UPD in the activities of the regulatory network a bit more um, smoothly. Um, and of course, uh, to achieve that, we also have to support electronic exchange of product data between the competent authorities and the agency. Next slide, please. The way uh, then the system is built, let's say the different components that we have been working on over the last um, two years is uh, on, the, on the side you can see access management. So of course we have to make sure that only the people who are meant to see certain information can see that information. Uh, and then uh, this is applied across the board. So we have a data submission a uh, component that uh, is mainly for getting the data into the system. We have the UPD portal, which uh, deals with uh, the publishing of that information, searching, viewing, exporting, also some data analytics. Um, and of course, uh, once the data comes in, uh, we need a data repository that will have elements um, of what to record the data in the first place and persist it, but also um, to validate the data quality, um, have some historical um, overview of what has been happening with the product and document management, of course. And then we have the little component on the side uh, to manage the approval of variations without assessment. Um, next slide, please. This is a system overview, and this is just briefly to illustrate uh, the part that Anna is going to uh, show you later on. Uh, the slides um, will be available to you afterwards, so um, you feel free to have a deeper look into this overview and um, um, yeah, ask any questions about that. Um, next slide, please. Um, so here we come into the main functionalities of the Union Product Database. Um, so first we have um, the provision of product information by NCAs. Uh, so in, in comparison for those of you who, who may or may not know um, how the situation is on for human product databases here maintained by the agency, it's uh, in that case the MAHs that submit the product information. For the veterinary side, the decision was taken quite actively that it would be the NCAs submitting the product information. So this is what they do. Uh, MAHs, on the other hand, have to provide sales and availability information either via um, a web UI, but later on it will also be possible to provide this via an API. So that's an application programming interface. 
Um, then, uh, of course, the processing of variations not requiring assessment has to be supported. Um, and that's both sides of the story. So on the one side, the submission through um, that is done by the MAHs and also the accept or reject activities um, or, uh, by the NCAs. Um, then... We also obviously have to look at uh, providing access to the product information to the public. So on the one hand, we have a public website component that will be uh, completely open. And on the other hand, of course, we have this restricted area for NCAs and MAHs where they have to log in and perform the activities uh, in, within their responsibility. Uh, the access management will be done via the EMA account management. If you have used any other systems at the agency, you're likely to have encountered this uh, system already. And as I mentioned before, we are using the SPOR controlled uh, vocabularies and organization data in the, in the system. Next slide, please. Now, um, as for the content, so what will actually be in the UPD and, and um, what will we do with it? Um, so on the one hand, we will have um, veterinary medicinal products that have been authorized, of course, um, and that includes uh, national authorizations. It includes the centrally authorized products and also MRPDCP products. Um, we will have uh, the homeopathic veterinary medicinal products that have been registered in accordance with Chapter 5. Uh, so that um, will also be included. And then uh, later on, we will on also have the veterinary medicinal products allowed to be used in a member state in accordance with Article 5.6 of the Regulation 2019-6. Um, so this is uh, essentially about um, medicines for animals which are exclusively kept as pets. This will not be part of the first release, um, but this information will be captured probably, well, most likely with a smaller data set um, by, um, uh, at some point in the, in the future, um, I think by 2024, we have to then also put those in. Now, in, in terms of for all these types of products, what kind of information do we capture? So we have uh, general product information that is handled via the controlled vocabularies I've mentioned a couple of times. So um, you have your, you know, um, your um, route of administration, pharmaceutical form, things like that. So there are data fields um, uh, I think Anna can give the, the correct number, but I think it's around about 45 data fields that are being completed in the UPD. Uh, then we have documents. So we have an SPC, um, the uh, package leaflet labeling and a public assessment report. Um, and then, of course, the information that will also be captured is the uh, annual volume of sales information on the availability of each veterinary medicine or product and information related to the processing of the variations um, not requiring assessment. Next slide, please. Um, this is just a very brief overview of the schedule. Um, we are, uh, of course, in the, in the very last phase of development here and uh, look to go live with the system in January on January 28th. Um, as planned. Next slide, please. And here, finally, um, I just wanted to uh, provide you a couple of links uh, for resources. So um, when you get access to the slides, you will be able to click on them. I would point you specifically, I think, to uh, the implementation guide, um, especially chapter seven, uh, which includes the guidelines for MAHs. If you look at this right now on our website, it won't be, it won't look very user friendly, I'm afraid, but we wanted to provide some initial specifications as early as possible to MAHs. And we are working on a, a new version that is, um, uh, let's say more, um, user-friendly to read perhaps as well um, at the moment and we will publish that as soon as we can. Uh, the second one I would like to highlight to you is the UPD release notes. So every time there is a release in production of the UPD and they happen 
uh, uh, frequently, um, we will publish the release notes and those documents will tell you what the current release contains, what it can do, and it will also tell you what it can't do. So as we are developing all these IT systems uh, under agile methodology, that uh, means that every release we do will still have some issues, of course, that we are fixing in the next release. Um, and the details of those and any necessary workarounds are detailed in the UPD release notes. Uh, so definitely very interesting and important documents to look at. Um, and then finally, we already had a, a UPD webinar for MAHs that was held on the 15th of September in 21. Um, and the recording presentation and Q&As are available on our website as well. And, and uh, lastly, but not least, um, the UPD webpage uh, has links um, to the training activities for MAHs that are upcoming. So I would suggest you keep an eye on that. And with that, I would um, hand over to Anna for her part. Thank you. Hi, Anna. Thank you very much. And uh, yeah, good afternoon to everyone. I'm going to share my screen. Okay, so this is the demonstration is uh, over the Union product database, the UPD portal is what we have currently on the screen, is the web user interface of the Union product database that will allow uh, competent authorities and marketing authorization holders to fulfill their legal requirements uh, based on the new regulation, veterinary regulation that will come into force on the 28th of January. So, mark, uh, competent authorities will be able through this portal to create and to maintain veterinary medicinal products authorized in the European economic area and marketing authorization holders will be able to, man, uh, to provide post authorization data on these products. Uh, post authorization data uh, is considered the volume of sales the availability status of the product, the marketing authorization status when a product gets uh, revoked or suspended, uh, and also we need to uh, consider the variations not requiring assessment. So before we go into detail of each one of the functionalities, and today uh, due to the, the short time that we have, it will be an overview. I would like to mention that this is a test environment. So the data that you are going to see, it's a uh, yeah, it's test data, so you will see inconsistencies in the data. You will see duplicates, uh, and you will realize that uh, yeah, it's uh, not correct. Uh, you will see also we are working on in agile mode, so it means that today we are developing while we are well. I am test or demonstrating uh, the Union product database, so all the functionalities are not uh, completed for this demonstration. Um, yeah, and for example, we have not finalized, yes, uh, it will be ready within uh, one or two weeks, the authorization. Uh, and that's why it, on the screen now, even if I am, uh, I'm going to change, I'm logging as a Pfizer user, I'm a marketing authorization holder, I am able to see functionalities that are specific for uh, competent authorities. So once that we finalize uh, the authorization in the portal, we will not be able, or a marketing authorization holder will not be able to see function specific functionalities for competent authorities and the other way around. So in this case, uh, I'm in, yeah, at the moment I am a marketing authorization holder. Uh, I'm Pfizer at Germany. Uh, the portal, will not allow me to create products, but okay, for this demonstration, uh, I'm going to give you also the overview of what can do uh, um, competent authority can do. So EMA and NCAs will be able to create products in UPD. Uh, the products were already mentioned by Jana, they will be able to create national authorized products, centralized products, products approved under uh, the centralized procedures, mutual recognition or subsequent recognition procedures, also homeopathic products and parallel traded products. And this will be what will be delivered by uh, the minimum viable product. Okay, once I'm going to show you, uh, I will not create today a product, but I will show the form that will allow the uh, competent authority to create a product. 
So as you can see, uh, and was already mentioned as well by Jana, this, uh, the implementation of the UPD portal is based on the BET implementation guide. The BET implementation guide uh, specifies all the attributes that the product will have in UPD. So every field that you see on the screen, you can go to the guide and to read uh, the specifications and what should be provided by the competent authorities. So all these sections that we see on the menu on the left are also in the VET implementation guide. We have a section for veterinary medicinal product information, another for the regulatory entitlement information that will contain uh, yeah, all the data related to the uh, authorization itself, uh, like the marketing uh, authorization holder, responsible authority, procedure number when applicable, entitlement number, uh, country, all the, da the data related to this, uh, to the authorization that has been granted. We have another section for ingredients, another for pharmaceutical product, another for manufacturer item, and for package medicinal product. So once that the uh, competent authority, once that the competent authority has filled in the form and creates the product, two things can happen. Uh, you can go, you will receive or the UPD portal will generate a notification for competent authorities and for marketing authorization holders, and you will be able to search this product in UPD. So in case the product is created, UPD is generating these notifications and a user will need to come here to check which new products or which uh, other actions in the UPD has happened. So in this case, uh, these are the notifications that you will receive on a daily basis. We have implemented currently only the updates and the creations, notifications for these two actions, but we are currently working on another notifications. We will have notifications for create, for updates, nullification, variations not requiring assessment, and also for submission of volume of sales, availability status data, and marketing authorization status. Okay, how we can search for our notifications, we can use uh, different search criteria, we can use the procedure number, the permanent identification number, product identification number, authorization country, marketing authorization holder, a range of date, product name and action. Marketing authorization holder, uh, we have added because maybe a user has different roles for different organizations. So in this case, I only have Pfizer, but it could be that I have more than one uh, role for more than one organization. Uh, marketing authorization holders will be able to search uh, and view the products or the notifications for the products for which they have a role in the organization. In this case, it's only Pfizer. Each one of the notifications will provide a, yeah, information on the action. In this case, if we see the first one, it has been one update and the system uh, allows the user to navigate to the product information, to the view of the product. So in this case, if I press, I will navigate to the section uh, where I can see more detailed information on the product. Okay, this is a way to go to the view of the product and we have the other one that is directly by searching your products. In this case, okay, I will be able to see only the products from Pfizer because this is, a, I am a link or affiliated only to this organization. Okay, and I will be able to navigate to the view product from this screen as well. This is the search screen and we have a similar criteria that we had on the notifications. Uh, here we have some more uh, filters like a ATC bit code or target species, authorization country, procedure type. You have different criteria and you can also combine all of them to do to perform your search. So in this case, if I go to the table and I press uh, on one of my, my products, a product card will appear on the right giving me providing uh, more information on this product, but not the complete information. So if I want to see the detail of uh, my product, I will need to press on the link and I will have the complete information of this product. This product uh, has also different sections. You can see and you can navigate through the whole information with the menu that we have on the left-hand side. 
So we have general information, veterinary medicinal product name information. Uh, if you have a name of a product in more than one uh, language, and per country you will uh, see all the uh, names in this section. We have also marketing authorization registration procedure section. We have product classification that will give information about legal basis, ATC bit code and legal status for the supply. Then we have information on the pharmaceutical product. In this case, this product has two pharmaceutical products. We will have information on the manufacturing uh, business operations, the manufacturers. Then we have another section for the pharmacovigilance information. In this case, is the information about the pharmacovigilance system master file and the uh, QPPB, the qualified person for the pharmacovigilance. We have a section for documents, and as mentioned for Jana, the UPD documents is the SPC, the package leaflet, the labeling, and the public assessment report. And then we have information uh, about the packages. In this case, we have two packages. Okay. Now, this is the view of the product. And also, UPD will allow the user, the marketing authorization holder, to navigate uh, among the different versions of the product. In this case, we have only one version, but uh, every update to the product will generate a new version, and you will be able to navigate through all these changes. You will not be able to edit the product. This is a functionality because we have not implemented yet uh, completely the authorization, and that's why you see here edit product data. This will be enabled only for competent authorities. Now, beside this functionality, uh, the search uh, view and view notifications that is uh, shared by both uh, actors, the competent authorities and the marketing authorization holders, we have a specific uh, functionalities for marketing authorization holders. And these are the variations not requiring assessment, that is the submission. The approval of rejection will need to be done by the competent authority. And then we have the other post authorization data. We are going to start uh, with the variations not requiring assessment. And in this case, I'm going to play two roles. Uh, I have here the session with the marketing authorization holder that is Pfizer, but I have in another browser here uh, yeah, the competent authority user. These are two test users. With one, I will do the submission, and with the competent authority one, I will approve, reject these variations. So, in this case, we are with Pfizer. I'm going to submit a variation not requiring assessment. Okay, that's the screen that allowed to create the submission. First step is to select the uh, variations. So, I'm going to select the change or the update uh, the name, address, or contact details of the QPPB. This is the first variation. And the second one, I'm going to select to change the invented name of the veterinary medicinal product. Okay, we have here two variations and the system allowed to remove and to add uh, while you are uh, doing the submission or preparing this submission. Now that we have the variations, we need to retrieve the products. So, in this case, for the minimum variable product, the, uh, what we are, the restriction is that all the uh, variations or the products that you are going to select it in that in this page, needs, uh, they need to belong to the same responsible authority. With the exception of the products that have been approved under DCP, MRP, or SAP procedures, uh, and in this case, what the system will control is that they have all the same product identifier. These are the restrictions, so in this case, I'm going to select a national product. Okay, I will select this one. And if I try now to select a, from another country, this one, Equest, belongs to Ireland, and I have selected one from France, so the system doesn't allow me to continue because they need to belong to the same responsible authority. Okay, I have selected that product, and now I have to complete the submission. So what is what it is requested is that I provide a BNIS file because I have here now two variations for the same product, 
but I need to tell to the uh, competent authority which are the changes or I need to provide more detailed information. And sometimes uh, I will need to provide supporting documents or UPD documents. All this information will need to be uh, included in the BINIS file. So I'm going to retrieve my BINIS file. And also I will need to provide uh, the date of implementation and optionally the submission comment. So date of implementation, if you see this is the header of the submission, anytime that I uh, add the date of implementation in the header of the submission, it will apply to both products. So in this case, if I select that the variation was uh, implemented uh, the 24th of October, it will apply to both of them, but I can change if I want uh, the date just uh, one by one. So in this case, we only have two products, but you could have 100 and then maybe uh, you want uh, it's easier if with this, op uh, with this functionality, you will not need to provide 100 times uh, the date if for most of them was the same date. So the submission comment will apply to uh, the whole uh, submission. So there is no submission comment specific for a variation. Okay. And now finally, we have the two variations uh, for the same product. Finally, before I can submit, the system is requesting that I check these two uh, boxes. And this is to confirm to the competent authority that uh, as a marketing authorization holder, I am fulfilling all the, uh, yeah, the conditions uh, that are uh, required by the Commission Implementing Regulation. And here is the typo, it's not 2017, it's 2021. Uh, slash 17. And also, uh, I need uh, to confirm to the um, competent authorities that I am providing the supporting documents and the UPD documents that are also uh, required in the Implementing Act. So I will check the two boxes and I will submit the variations. Okay, so the uh, submission was already done. And now I want to see the status of my submission. As a marketing authorization holder, I go to view variations and this is uh, my comment, test submission comment C1 and A2. Okay, I want to see the detail of uh, the uh, submission. I have, uh, as mentioned, two variations for one product and this is, a, I cannot edit because I can only view. Now is the time of the competent authority to approve or reject. Also, uh, I'm able to download here the BINIS file. And we have added here a summary table where the marketing authorization holder and competent authorities will be a summary of the variations that are in the, within the submission. Here is not a, maybe is not really a useful because we only have two, but when you have 100, it's nice to have at the end of the submission a summary table with the uh, complete information. So now I'm going to move to the other screen. Okay, sorry, I need to log in again. And I will move here. Okay. Okay, each 30 minutes the system will disconnect. So I need to log in again. Okay, and this is not, I didn't want the marketing authorization folder. So I will log out and log in again. Okay, sorry. And now I will introduce my password.
So now uh, I'm going to approve or reject the variations. I will go to also the panel to the B variations. And is the 121 the one that I need to <coughs> review? In this case, I can edit data on the submission and the information that I need to provide uh, in order to approve or reject is the decision comment, the date of the decision and the author of the decision. Of course, I will need to apply the changes uh, after the approval uh, or rejection or, uh, or before uh, doing, I will need to apply the changes in UPD. So I will need to go to the products and if the variation is impacting in the product data, I will need to do the, uh, the updates. In this case, because we don't have too much time, I will not go to this part. What we are going to do is to approve or reject the variations. So again, the same, if I use the header of the submission, it will apply to both of them. I'm going to select a, yeah, the date of the decision. This is the author of the decision. I can uh, select approve all or reject all in this case. I can select approve and then to do a partial approval, I can do one by one. Uh, we have all the information, decision comment, author of the decision and date of the decision. So I'm going to submit my uh, decision. In this case, I have approved the first one and the second one is pending. If I go now to the variations, okay, we see that this is still pending. I'm going to reject the second one I will enter here and I will reject the second one. I cannot edit anymore the first one because already I did the decision and you cannot edit your decision. So this is a, I can add here an explanation to the marketing authorization holder. Again, I need to add uh, the author of the decision and the date of the decision I will select today. So I'm going to submit the rejection. And now in the summary table, I have one rejected and one approved. I will come back to the, yeah, to the other screen that is uh, I'm using Pfizer and I will go to see the submission, the status. So in this case, it has disappeared because when I go to the view, the first thing that the system will show me is the, pen, the, is the pending ones. This has been completed by the competent authority. So when I go to search for the 121, that is the submission, I will see that it's partially approved. Partially approved, it means that has been completed, but not all the variations are approved. Some are approved, some rejected. So that's the functionality on a variations requiring assessment. And I'm going to try to be a bit uh, more quick with the other post authorization data. So the first uh, other post authorization data is the marketing authorization status that the marketing authorization holder will need to provide when the product gets suspended or revoked. In this case, uh, this functionality is not completed. Uh, I'm going to show part of the flow. I will need to select a product. I can select Apocale. I will accept as a marketing authorization holder. And now the system is asking me, do you, is the product suspended or revoked? I will put suspended. I will need to select marketing authorization uh, change date when was suspended. So I can put yesterday and then I will submit the information. Okay, and now the service is not working, but what will happen in UPD is that for this product, the marketing authorization the status will get suspended and the availability status will get uh, not marketed. We will change for all the packages, not marketed. And this information, of course, will be moved or public uh, published in the general public portal. Uh, this is the marketing authorization status. The availability status and volume of sales, uh, the flow is really similar. We have not completed the availability status, so I will go for the volume of sales. And then the flow for availability status is quite similar. As mentioned by Jana, if you go to the chapter seven in the VET implementation guide, you have now some specifications for the provision of the volume of sales, and they will be enriched. And we will share a new version of the chapter with more info detailed information on how you need to to do the provision of the volume of sales uh, during the next weeks. Okay, so the volume of sales has several steps. 
first thing, the marketing authorization holder will need to retrieve all the packages for the products for which uh, it has a role. So in this case, it's only Pfizer. I will get all the packages for the products of Pfizer. We are working uh, this change uh, of data between UPD and the user uh, is by CSV files. And we will see now one example. So I have retrieved all my packages, the information of my packages. A CSV file is a, a yeah, is in a standard uh, yeah, in a standard file used to uh, exchange information. In this case, all the information is separated by commas. I'm going to explain you Excel has a functionality that will allow to uh, see this data in an easy uh, way. So I will indicate that we want to see uh, in a table. Okay, so this is the information that we have retrieved from the system. We have the product identifier, the product name, the permanent identifier, authorization procedure number, package identifier, package description, pack size unit uh, presentation identifier, the country, country identifier, marketing authorization number, and creation date of a product. This is the information that we are going to retrieve from the data repository. And in order to submit, we will need, <coughs> apologies, we will need to provide the month and year for the volume of sales, <clears throat> the volume of sales, the species identifier, the percentage of tar the volume of sales on this uh, target species selected, the dose factor, and optionally a comment. So this is the first step. We retrieve the packages from the system. Second step is to prepare what we want to submit. So we are going to submit the volume of sales. And I have prepared here uh, yeah, a file, a CSV file with what we want to submit. In this case, I'm, uh, I have uh, selected one product. This product has two packages. This is a comment. And for each one of the packages, we, uh, I am providing the volume of sales for the year uh, 22 from January to October. So if we see the first row, uh, the information that we need to provide to the system is the package identifier linked to the country, and then all the information that we were mentioning uh, before. That is the month and year, the volume of sales, then the target species, in this case uh, is buffalo. I, I was uh, looking at the uh, RMS before. Then we have uh, the percentage of the target species. So for this uh, package, we only have one target species. If we have more than one target species, we will need to add more rows to the uh, file. But all these uh, explanations will be provided in the chapter seven. Now uh, we need to provide the dose factor, in this case is one, and the comment that is optional. I have used this uh, just for test uh, purposes. So we have here the file of the volume of sales. I'm going to select the file from the uh, from my uh, laptop. Um, and the one that I have prepared is this one. So we will submit. Okay, upload document completed. Now, we have here uh, an issue or a bug in this, uh, okay, a performance uh, bug. I will say because the time that is, uh, yeah, the system is spending more than 10 minutes in order to process a file today. So we are improving this. Uh, then I am not going to wait 10 minutes. Uh, I will see here, this is the submission view. That is the third option. Uh, in the future, the uh, file will appear uh, quicker, but now we will not wait this 10 minutes or more that is spending uh, currently. Now, if I want to see here, the view submission, this panel, what will show me is all my submissions and will give me information, the ones that have been processed correctly from the, uh, from the system will appear here with a check, like it was okay. And if there were errors, I will be able to retrieve again a CSV file that will 
point me to all the rows that have an error and we'll, uh, we have a, for each error we have a code and we will provide detailed information on this error. So this is the view submission and now we have the view volume of sales and the view volume, volume of sales it works uh, just by selecting a product. I'm going to select this one. Uh, I'm going to do the search for permanent identifier. As you know, uh, the permanent identifier is the ID of the product unique ID in UPD. So each uh, veterinary medicinal product has a unique permanent identifier. In this case, I have searched for this one. And again, I can retrieve the volume of sales, I will select, I want all the volume of sales reported in January for this product uh, in 2021, sorry, from January to October, and I will press download uh, sales. I will get a CSV file, and the format is the same one than the one that I was using for the submission. In this case, we have only submitted uh, one month, I will uh, convert here to columns, text to columns again. And then the last part of the submission is the information that has been provided by the user. In this case was the volume of sales uh, yeah, that were provided in April 2021, 250, the target species, uh, if you want to, you can convert to number and you will need to check in RMS. In this case, it's dogs, but because I saw before, uh, but you can check in RMS which uh, target species belong to this code. Target species percentage is 100, those factor one, and the comment valid one package. So that's the functionality for uh, what we have seen today. I'm going to do a rec recap of everything. Uh, marketing authorization holders from 28th of January. The functionalities that uh, you will be able to do through the UPD portal is the submission of the marketing authorization status when gets suspended or revoked, the availability status, the volume of sales, and the submission of variations not requiring assessment. And of course, you will be able to search, to view, and to search and view products and notifications. Uh, yeah, that's a, I have completed the, yeah, that's a UPD portal. Ivo, I hand over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Anna, and thank you very much, Jana, for uh, this presentation, which was, I think, a very extensive uh, uh, pre uh, demonstration of uh, the UPD and, and what it can do. Uh, let me start by thanking you all for your active participation in today's event. Uh, thank all the speakers for their excellent presentations and for bringing so much information, uh, possibly at some point uh, too much to process right away. But uh, rest assured that uh, that uh, we will keep you updated uh, on this. Uh, on, on the screen, uh, you can now see uh, the upcoming training activities for industry and uh, uh, and also... I think the second uh, 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 veterinary uh, info medicines info day, which is scheduled for the 30th of November. And we all encourage you to register to the uh, EMA's uh, VMP REC program newsletter by, by emailing to vetchangeprogram at emaeuropa.eu and to monitor EMA's website for updates related to the program and, and which are very relevant for the industry. I think that uh, we hope that the, the event uh, has sparked reflection and additional questions, which you can always uh, send to uh, that same address that I just mentioned and is now displayed on uh, the screen. Um, going through the, the sessions uh, that we've seen today, uh, we started off by uh, uh, a session on uh, EMA support for SME developing innovative veterinary med medicines. And uh, I'd, I'd like to say that the EMA SME office is, is the dedicated contact point providing full regulatory, administrative and procedural assistance to SMEs who want to develop and market medicines uh, for human and or veterinary use in, in Europe. Furthermore, uh, EMA tries to foster and support innovation. Uh, so um, uh, EMA uh, recently established novel therapies and technologies working party is one of the examples uh, for that. And, um, 
I would like to thank uh, uh, both uh, Frida and Susanna for uh, providing us with uh, uh, good presentations on that, despite the technical difficulties that we had in that uh, first session. Uh, in session two, on planning a successful marketing authorization application, uh, and, and this, uh, again, it also relates to session one. Uh, one of the advices was on the scientific advice to ask clear questions. And for SMEs, time is crucial to survival. Keep, keep the regulatory framework and the timelines in mind, and, and potentially longer regulatory process is needed for uh, innovative products. SMEs' experiences incorporating with EMA and their successes which have been presented uh, from the point of, uh, indeed, small and medium-sized enterprises, show the value of the support that the agency can provide to these processes. So we're open to discuss it at early stages and, and afterwards, and uh, we would like to continue that. And I would like to remind you that, in principle, the new regulation offers even more opportunities uh, for innovative medicines uh, in, the, in the new uh, regulation that we, that we have at hand. Um, the, um, on, the, on the veterinary uh, municipal products regulation, uh, which was uh, session number three, with presentations by uh, Jordi and Suzanne, um, scientific guidance on, on the VMP rec pro is progressing well and is in line with, with our planning. Uh, we still uh, aim for uh, a full delivery of the VMP reg on January 2022. The development of databases, which we've seen uh, in the last session, uh, are very crucial for the application of that new regulation, is on track. And data submission now needed to ensure benefits are realized. And when I say data submission here, it's the legacy uh, uh, data, the legacy products, and that input that needs to be provided. And the preparedness uh, of, uh, activities for industry should be ramping up in quarter four, 2022. Also in that session, and I only uh, attended that last part, has shown a, a lot of interest in limited markets. And uh, I've seen that there is a request for an additional webinar on this. I, I do feel that, uh, uh, that, that, that that would be a useful exercise and that it would be interesting uh, uh, to go that way. Uh, a lot of questions. Uh, like with uh, some of the other sessions, we're, we're not always in a position to answer those questions, but we'll try to do so after this uh, meeting. Uh, moving on to the post-authorization uh, pharmacovigilance. Um, presentation has shown that, that signal management is a continuous life cycle process for veterinary and medicinal products, and the Union Pharmacovigilance database will need to be used continuously. And uh, it, it, it would require both from the side of marketing authorization holders as well as the side uh, of the uh, competent authorities, very active involvement uh, to make sure that that new system of pharmacovigilance will deliver and that it will eventually uh, be an effective way and efficient way of monitoring pharmacovigilance of veterinary medicinal products. Again, please join the training activities for industry and, and follow updates on the EMA websites and the VMP REC program newsletter, which will keep you uh, uh, on track. Then uh, on session uh, uh, number five, the, the union uh, product database. A union product database will, will be uh, pivotal for some of the regulatory processes and specifically for the uh, uh, post-authorization uh, data that will need to be submitted. And we therefore encourage all industry, SMEs, as well as the, the bigger industry, to familiarize with the resources uh, available and to get in touch with EMA for any questions not covered in the existing materials. Uh, please keep an eye on the EMA website and, again, the newsletter for information on UPD trainings for industry because we are uh, continuously developing new trainings and the training schedule may change. Uh, we've seen the demo provided by Anna, and, and I would like to thank her very much, showing the advanced stage of uh, the UPD and, and the way it will work. Uh, and, and I think the demo provided you an excellent opportunity to see it from all sides and to see that the system, uh, as it will go live in January 2022, can actually be expected uh, to work. Um, and... Uh, 
uh, on the on the on the questions and answers uh, for session six, uh, uh, main questions on the pharmacovigilance side master file, which unfortunately we could not answer all, but where uh, Jos has committed to make sure that the information will become available soon. And with that, I would like from my side to close uh, today's session. I would like to thank all attendees, uh, all presenters, all participants uh, for their contribution. I'm not sure, Constantinos, if you would like to say anything at the very end of this meeting. So I would like to hand over to you. Uh, thank you, Ivo. No, very little to add. No, thank you for, for wrapping up. Uh, it, it just... Uh, uh, just I would like to to thank all the uh, the companies that are attending this event today. Uh, uh, I, I mean, the event really triggered a lot of interest, which is really really uh, nice to see. Um, and um, yes, a big thanks to also to all the teams, so in the the vet division and in the SME office, uh, for for putting together the, this program. So in this last quarter, so no, thank you very much to everybody. Okay, thank you for that, Constantinos. And then last but not least, I would like to thank the support team that has been uh, uh, really pivotal in making this uh, meeting uh, happen. So uh, a virtual applause for, uh, for that support and, uh, and hope to see you next year. Thank you very much.